Let's have a look at exercise B2. So in this exercise, we're going to create a crate. Um, uh, and we're going to add and remove dependencies, create unit tests, blah, blah, blah. So let's have a see how it looks. So first of all, we're going to create a new project by saying cargo new minus minus name quizzer. So let's quit out of our Vim here. Go up a directory. Cargo new. Was it cargo new? Yeah, minus minus name quizzer. Um, okay. Um, I think we just want to say cargo new quizzer. Um, I think it's confused because we're inside another workspace, but I think that's done. I think it's done it. Um, all right, it's made as a project called quizzer, and let's have a quick look at. Um, so here's the cargo.toml. And oops, and it's made as uh, main.rs like this. And that will compile. Yeah, I think it's just a bit confused because we're inside some other workspace. So let's not worry about it. Uh, now, uh, it's going to act as both a binary and a library. So we need to make a lib.rs. And also, um, in, we're going to make a bin directory with quizzes as main. So um, we need to change our project layout a, a little bit. So let's come out of them for a second. And let's make a directory inside source called bin. And then let's make a directory inside there called quizzer. And let's move our main inside bin quizzer. And then let's make a new file called lib.rs. So yeah, um, I think we've talked already about how you can have a Rust project that contains both um, a library and multiple main methods. So we've set up our project. Let's just double double show you. So we've, we've set up our project so that it's a library and that's its kind of main purpose, but it also has a bunch of bins um, with these sub, these subdirectories inside. So a bunch of executables that are inside these subdirectories of bin. You can, by the way, inside bin just have a file called quizzer.rs instead of putting it inside a subdirectory like this. Uh, either of those works. It kind of just automatically, if you say cargo run, um, um, let's try adding an empty workspace. So this, I'm not sure this is what we're supposed to be hitting when, um, when we make this project, I think this might be a bug, but anyway. Okay, yeah, so we just told it, so uh, what we did there was we just told it to ignore the fact that it's inside a workspace and just treat this as a completely separate uh, uh, project. Um, so that should be fine. So we've still got this, this structure of uh, main, main.rs inside this bin slash quizzer thing, and then a library, our library's going to live somewhere. Uh, going to do something inside this lib.rs. So let's see what else they tell us to do. So we've made that structure. We haven't yet made quiz.json. So let's make a quiz.json file just so that it's there. And then we better read about... And let's make it an empty JSON file just to keep it happy. And then we better read about what we're supposed to do in this project. So first of all, we're going to need to add some dependencies. Um, and we should quickly read about what these dependencies are before we um, before we add them. So let's look first at anyhow. So anyhow is the uh, the type we were just looking at before, which um, gives us this anyhow result, uh, which is actually just a result of a t comma anyhow error. So it's exactly the thing we saw in the previous exercise. Uh, it just makes error handling easier. And they want anyhow 1.0. So we can do, let's go into the quizzer and we can do cargo add. Now I'm going to, I want to add it with a version and I don't know how to do that. So I guess it's minus minus version or something, but let's see. Cargo add. Maybe there's no way of saying what version. 
Surely there is. Okay, we'll just edit it later if needed, need be. There probably was a way that I missed there, but anyway. So cargo add, uh, anyhow. And that's going to add it to our cargo.toml. So let's have a quick look at what happened to our cargo.toml. So it's that ended up looking like this, saying give us version 1.0.82. Um, uh, next, they suggest that we use clap. So clap is a library for uh, parsing command line arguments. And let's have a quick look at the quick start. So one way of using this, which is possibly the most convenient, is to uh, create a struct which defines like what command line arguments you're expecting, like name, config, debug, etc. Uh, and you just tell it to like derive the clap parser thing and like add some extra stuff and then you can you just say parse it and it just magically gives your program command line arguments that will work nicely it just populates a an instance of that CLI struct with this stuff based on what the user types on the command line so it's really nice library I've used it before so I'm pretty happy to say we're gonna use it cargo add clap um, and we've had, it has indeed added version 4, which is what they tell us to add. Well, they said 4.0, but I think a later compatible version is okay. And they also want SERDI JSON and SERDI. So SERDI JSON is the bit of SERDI that's responsible for doing JSON stuff, and SERDI itself is the bit that's responsible for just saying this thing can be deserialized. So that's exactly what we were just talking about in the last exercise too. So let's add those. Cargo add SERDI JSON. And I'm going to, I know I'm going to need, oh no, it's not. And then cargo add SERDI, and I know I'm going to need features. I know I'm going to need the derive feature. I might need others, but let's see. So uh, it's added SERDI, SERDI JSON, and CLAP, as we saw. Uh, and this is the more expanded way of... So if we didn't need that feature, we could have just said SERDI equals 10198. Because we wanted features, we needed to use this version this more expanded thing um, with the curly brackets to say we need these features. And they're going to tell us we want some other features as well. So they're going to tell us that clap. So we, we added the derived feature, as I said. We also need the derived feature of clap. So I'm going to explain what these features do in a second. So we have to just, like, maybe there's a cargo add command for this. I'm not sure. But yeah, we, we want the... Um, the drive feature of both of these. So both of these features, oh, there's an extra comma there, that's not going to work. Um, both of these features add the ability to do derive blah before your struct. And both of them are optional features, which is why we had to specify them. And that's because uh, anything that has like complicated macros in it can be like slow to build and stuff. Is that right? Anyway, um, especially SERDI uh, is very widely used, so it's quite careful to not give you features you didn't ask for because it might slow down your builds or bloat your binaries. Um, so it doesn't give you features like derive unless you actually need it. And you might think, well, I always use derive. Um, and yeah, if you're using SERDI explicitly, you're, you're quite likely to use derive. But if you're writing some kind of library that just allows other people to use SERDI in some way, or use your stuff with SERDI in some way, you might not need the derive macro or something like that. You know, There might be reasons why you don't need it, so um, SERDI doesn't want to force it on every single person that uses SERDI, um, or someone who just unthinkingly depends on SERDI. So you have to explicitly say, I want this feature derived, which lets me do derived, deserialized, and derived serialized. Okay, so, yep, the non-standard drive features added. For clap, it allows us to derive the parser trait, which we saw a second ago. And the drive feature from SERDI allows us to add serialize and deserialize, as I said. Okay, so I think we've done part A. I guess we should check whether we can, like, run it or something. Nope. Because uh, I'm on too old a version of Rust. I'm going to take a break here, then, while I upgrade my Rust. And... Uh, I'll see you after the break. Okay, we're back and uh, I've updated my Rust and I've run a cargo test and all the tests pass. And if I do a cargo run, 
uh, it says hello world. It ran our quiz at target. So it ran our main method that says hello world. So it's all working. So the exercise is about design and finding information. I need to figure out a model to represent my quiz questions, as well as a means to store them into a JSON file and load them up. Um, and parse program arguments. We'll use the project we just set up to write a quiz game creator and player. You may add other dependencies needed, blah, blah, blah. So it runs as a command line tool. It has two modes, question entering and quiz mode. The mode is selected with a subcommand, passed as the first argument to the program. Question entering mode, so you can enter multiple choice questions with four answers, one of them being correct. The questions are stored in that JSON file. And then it loads questions from JSON file and presents them, checks the answer, and so on. Okay. Errors are handled correctly. Your collection doesn't panic if it encounters unexpected stuff. We can use anyhow and question mark. Question mark operator we've already covered, so we can check that if we need to. Um, creating, storing, loading questions defined in the library. That makes sense. User input and stuff like that is defined in the application. Fine, we do that. And we'll divide it up into modules. Before I start, make sure you've listed all open questions and found answers to them. Okay, I, I think we'll just design as we go. I won't really follow that advice, sorry. Um, okay, so I think uh, the first thing I want to do is figure out how to do command line, uh, do like a subcommand in um, in clap. So let's think this through, and I'm going to need to be doing some looking up like they suggest. Um, but let's just call this command line arguments. Something like that. So we're going to have two subcommands, and I already don't know how clap handles subcommands. So let's have a quick look at the clap documentation. Crates.io slash crates slash clap should do it. And then we can jump to documentation. That's that's one way of finding documentation about a module that you know the dependency you know the name of. So we'll go to the documentation. And we probably want the derived tutorial. Because we're gonna we're gonna do this derive parser thing. So we're gonna use clap parser. Oh, and subcommand. That looks hopeful, doesn't it? Okay. Here's a subcommand. Okay, so it's gonna it's gonna look very similar to this. So um, I don't know what long about is about. We probably want to arrive the parser. We probably want to be able to output a version. Let's say. Um, so it's gonna look something like this. Should complain that it doesn't know what parser is, and then should we should be able to import it. Um, maybe just run a cargo check and it'll complain at us. Yeah, so consider importing clamp parser. That's what we want. Now maybe it'll also moan about not knowing about command. I'm not sure. Command is... I'm not sure where command comes from in this code. Maybe they've just forgotten to include it. Um, we'll see. Okay, and then we're going to want something like this, a subcommand. And the two, the two subcommands are going to be for entering... Um, entering questions or asking questions. So let's call them add and um, quiz. So it's add mode and a quiz mode. Like this. And it's going to be that uh, I presume this thing is the, yeah, okay, yeah, there's an enum of like, oh, hold on. Hold on, yeah, I've done this wrong. So this is going to be, this is just going to be a subcommand that we just should just call command. And then there's going to be an enum that has a list of all the possible commands. Yeah, that was obviously that's the right way to do it. So we're going to derive subcommand. 
and we have an enum commands and it's going to be ask and quiz no add and quiz like so um, and I don't think we're going to have any other if I, if I remember the exercise I think you then have to type in yeah, you enter multiple choice quiz questions four possible answers for each okay um, so I don't know why I um, don't know why my Vim is complaining. Oh, perhaps because I've got com caps lock on. Um, let's try that again. Right, so now I'm hoping Rust Analyzer is going to complain at me. It was somehow confused, I think. Still doesn't like... Doesn't like my... Um, Cargo.tom or something like that, I think. Um, tell it to restart, maybe it'll do better. So we're definitely going to need to import subcommand, like so. Um, I feel like we're going to need to import command, but maybe it's already done. Um, but we can follow the, the documentation anyway, so. Um, we did that command subcommand business, yep. So what I want to do is just um, uh, just to demonstrate that we can like have two modes and it will print something different for the two different modes. So I think it's something along the lines of CLI args um, pars or something. Maybe this will show us. Yeah, yeah. So it's just pars. Let args equal args pars. The fact that my IDE is not helping me Maybe it will help us be more explicit about what things. So let's first of all let's just print out arcs. Let's see what we get. Let's get rid of our hello world and see if we can run this code yet. Ah, okay. CLI arcs is not uh, debug, so we can make it debug. So I can print it out, and that will mean that this needs to be debug as well. No problem with doing that. Now, um, oh, I spelt subcommand wrong. Fine. In two places. Okay, it printed it out and it said you gave me no command. So now let's try running it. Now, if we were just running the the executable itself, we would do dot slash target blah 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 quizzer right and then we could say the subcommand of add and it would be add or subcommand of something we don't know it would say that's no good or subcommand of quiz would say quiz but if you're doing cargo run you have to do minus minus and then add and it does the same thing if you say cargo run add like that then it, under some circumstances not here it appears um, Cargo won't know that you want to pass on the add to your program. It might try and pass that argument itself, especially if that argument starts with minus minus or something. So always say for after the cargo run to do your minus minus so that it knows everything else goes to the executable in building. Okay, so we've got the parsing command line arguments point. Now, um, I really like to write everything test driven. So I'm going to try and figure out how to do that which means we're going to need to use clap in a slightly less convenient way, but it's worth it. So, um, we're going to write a test for, um, let's just call it add sub command is recognized. No, what do we want to do? We want to say, we want to be able to kind of run our program with the with a set of arguments yeah, we don't want to test clap, like it's, we know that clap's going to parse our arguments, right? What we want to say is add subcommand asks for questions, something like that. 
And so we're going to make a CLI uh, manually instead of providing arguments. So we're going to kind of pretend that we passed something. Uh, and it's going to be, it's going to have a command of add. And then we're going to do run some kind of program, passing in the command line arguments. And probably passing in something else, and then we're going to do some kind of assertion um, of like some kind of standard output that we've got. Standard out is going to say something like um, enter a new question. Something like that. So we need to make something to be a standard output, and we're going to pass it into run. So if we make a real standard output here, um, it's going to be, I think the thing is called stood out. I think it might be called stood out, colon, colon, stood out. I'm not sure though. So let's see what the compiler says about that. Oh, it should be like stood. Stood, stood out. Maybe. With a D. No, all right, so we've got to do some cooking. Uh, stood IO stood out, that's what I was looking for. And, oh, we just should call, ah, it's stood IO stood out. So, here yeah, we're going to be stood IO stood out, like this. And we're going to call some kind of run function, which gets args. Oh, this should probably be called args, shouldn't it? This should be called args. Um, I really messed up. My Rust upgrade has messed up my um, COC config in my editor. All right, so we're going to run uh, run a function called run, and we're going to pass in stood out. Uh, and run is going to be a function, which and the point is we can test the run function. We're not going to test the main function, so we're going to put as little as possible in there. Run is going to take in a CLI args, which we don't need to mock or anything like that. And it's also going to take in something that implements what is stood out. Stood out uh, is a stood out, and stood out implements what? Right. Yeah, it's something that can be written to. So um, run is going to take in something that implements right, and Oh, well, that's the something. The something should be called stood out. Let's say, and we're going to say stood out. So the thing about things that implement right is you can call right on them, or you can call. I guess you can call right and pass them in, like here, something like this. Let's see what the compiler makes of that. Well, you definitely want a semicolon after your line. So this should be stood IO right. Uh, like that, I think. And stood out needs to be mutable. If we're going to do that. And what? Ah, oh, that might fail. So I guess if it fails, we'll just unwrap it. If it goes wrong, we just want to crash. Well, I mean, if writing to stood out goes wrong, we want to crash. Other things we don't want to crash. Okay, that was fine. It didn't fail. When we run it, it printed out high. So it did what we wanted. I think there's a write LUN, which would probably be better here. So we've made our life slightly, yeah, there you go. Now it says hi and puts a 
new line. We made our, our lives slightly harder by not being able to use print learn because we want to have control over stood out so that we can test. So that's what this whole mess was all about. So we're going to make ourselves a stood out, something that implements right. And I'm pretty sure um, a string implements right. Let's see. Cargo test. Right, so not happy yet. Well, I called this CLI, it should be called args. We're not using uh, run crate. I'm actually going to do, I quite often do um, super colon colon star to say everything from the crate I'm in, I want to be able to test. Um, and that shouldn't be add, that should be um, command add. And, oh, it's saying string is not, Im not implement, string does not implement right. Who implements right? I'm sure someone a bit like string implements right. So who, who implements right? It should tell us here. Stood out as we saw an IO slice. Um, borrowed buffer, a buffered writer, some bytes. I guess the reason a string doesn't is because it, you, when you write into a, one of these streams, it could be, um, it could, it may not be string, it may not be UTF-8. So maybe a bytes would be the thing to use. Generally created by calling bytes on a reader. That doesn't sound right. Yeah, that doesn't sound right at all. Definitely not that. Not sure how that implements right. We can have a buffered writer. Um, I'm sure there's something we can use as a fake stood out. Rust. Um, fake stood out. Oh, like string writer or something. Someone's asking for exactly what I want. Um, oh, they make it, they just make a VEC of U8. Okay, well, that's fine. That was near enough what I was trying to do. So, this should just be a VEC. And then it's going to be a VEC of U8 is the same thing as a slice of U8, which is what this binary string thing is. So, B means this, this quoted thing coming after me is um, a slice of U8 instead of uh, a, an ampersand str. So now I can compare it against the stood out because stood out is a, a vec of U8s. I've spelt command wrong. Command's wrong. Um, it's an option. Like so. And... Ah, okay, so now, now we've got a problem, which is that we're passing this thing in, but we're also then using it afterwards. So I think probably what we want to do is pass in a reference to it, which might mean we don't even need impul. I think it's going to need to be mutable, isn't it? So I may as well put that now. This may not work, so bear with me. But I think something like this is going to be the right pattern. Fine. A den right would be fine. Obviously that needs to be mutable. Um. Oh, and I didn't do it here either. Okay, and now my um, test looks awful. I don't want to do that. 
So I want to turn this into a, a string like this, and then like so that will probably fail. Like I need to do something about what if it isn't UTF-8. Um, this should be unwrap. Here we go. All right. So now we've got a um, a test a test failure, which I can actually read. So we should have said enter a new question, and instead we said hi. Now we should have a new line at the end of this. And oh, my formatting's still working good. Um, okay, so we can make our first test pass by saying enter a new question code on here. And we're doing test driven development, so that's enough. Still got a warning because we're not using args in our run function. So let's just suppress that warning for a second. Okay, so we've written a test which says when we when we tell it to do add, then it prints out enter a new question. So that's good, um, but it's not actually waiting for us to um, enter a question and some answers and stuff like that. So in order to kind of force us to write code that actually does the work, um, we're going to need um, we're going to need a lot more than that. We're going to need input, and then we'll be able to read the input and stuff like that. But first. Let's write a test that, that checks that the uh, quiz subcommand asks us a question. Quiz subcommand asks a question. Now this is interesting because there won't be any questions initially, right? So um, we're going to need to handle the fact of like how do we give it questions. Um, so, okay, so that's kind of making life a bit difficult for ourselves. When we we're, at the moment, all we want to test is that this this quiz thing works. So, I guess we should we can do quiz sub command uh, complains if there are no questions, right? That would be a good thing to do, wouldn't it? Complains if there are no questions. So there, let's imagine there are no questions. We can say first enter some questions with a dot slash quizzer add. And that's going to have a new line at the end of it. Which looks like that. Um, okay, test going to fail because it doesn't know anything about the quiz sub command. It just says, still says, enter a new question. So this gives us a chance to modify this code a little bit. Sorry, not this code. <laughs> the run function to say, um, I guess we're going to match on args dot command, and the two possibilities are commands add, which is going to do something, or commands quiz. Which is going to do something else. And I think what I want it to do is call the add function. Yeah, why not? Uh, otherwise, it's going to call the quiz function. We're going to have to make those functions. And we're going to need to, we immediately see, we're going to need to pass in stood out. We're probably going to need to pass some more stuff in in a minute. And quiz is also going to need to have stood out passed into it. At the moment, we don't need any other command line arguments, so we don't need to pass args through. Maybe we'll need that later, but I think probably not, because it's all going to be interactive after the first argument. So now quiz should say what we said it should say, which is not there, not there. Here, new lines done for us. Please format my code. Ah, oh, I need a um, uh, Rust format. 
Rust from at dot. I think it's dot toml. And then I can't remember how you say how long a line should be. Um, maximum line next. And no, not array width, just line width or column width. Did I scroll past it? Line width, column. Width, some kind of width. Struck literal width, no, nothing so, nothing so esoteric. Width of an array, gosh, this is just like all the options to Rust format. I just want the easiest possible one you could imagine, Rust. Maximum line next, no. Come on, how hard can it be? Line width. Then now they're talking about line width, and they're still not telling us the Rust format commands for them. Gosh, I'm wasting a lot of your time. I do apologise. All right, let's not do it. Let's not do it. We can live without it. Okay. Um, we got some tests. They're not passing yet. Because these things are not right. These should be like this. And then otherwise I probably want to print out the help documentation. I think there's a way of saying, um, calling maybe a function like help. Um, let's look up the uh, clap. Um, derive documentation. So if I if I derive a parser, so I want to look up what what, a, what methods a parser has, I guess. Um, no, no, what, what we want what whatever parse returns. Oh no, parse returns a parser. Okay, so um, yeah, not sure. I I want a way of saying. Give me the, the help text. All right, I won't bother with that. So ideally, and there is a way of doing it. Um, uh, we would do something along the lines of printing out um, uh, the help text for this help uh, for this thing but let's just try say try dot slash quizzer minus minus help okay let's just check that works if you run it with no arguments uh, I need to like unwrap because that might fail so it now says try dot slash quizzer minus minus help so let's just check that our help message we gave is a useful one. Yeah, look. Now it prints out our help thing. It says, you run quizzer, and then you say what command you want. The commands are add quiz, or interestingly, help. So I could have done cargo run help uh, without the minus minus, and that works too. Fine. <laughs> Either way. Okay, so that, ideally, we'd figure out how to get clap to print the, the real help message when you just give no arguments, but this is fine. Um, so where are we at with passing tests? All our tests pass. So we're now distinguishing between add mode and quiz mode. And we're calling a new function for each of those. Uh, 
Um, now we're going to write some tests for these functions um, that do useful stuff. At some point, we're going to need to read in that JSON file or something, um, but not yet. And that's going to be interesting because I want to keep all the untestable stuff out in main. But in some cases, we want to read in the JSON file. In some cases, we want to modify the JSON file. So we, we somehow have to isolate that stuff to happen here and pass something in to run. But we can we can handle that. Maybe we'll have some kind of object struct, which is like the outside world, instead of just passing into it out directly. All right, so let's write a, a test for add. In fact, why don't we put add in a separate module? They told us to use modules, didn't they? Okay. So, um, now what did they tell us should live in the library and what should live in the executable? Because I've totally forgotten about that. Logic concerning storing, lo creating, storing, and loading quiz questions defined in the library part. Okay, so add is a perfect example. Um, and then user input and stuff is in the application code. Make sense? I mean, reading from, that's a bit, okay, never mind. We'll interpret that how we want to. So let's um, create a new file called source slash add. And still unhappy. I mean, I could try this command that's telling me to type, but I somehow suspect it's not going to be happy with that either. No. Okay. So we now have a new file here called add, and we're going to name it here. I guess we probably want pubmod add because it's going to have a function in it that we want to call from main. So we're going to use um, I think we're going to need to call, use the quizzer library to bring in the add function. Then the add function is going to disappear from here and it's going to go in the add library with a pub on it and then we're going to run and everything's going to be fine right oh it shouldn't be mod pub it should be pub mod not like that like that okay and we didn't bring in the inputs that we need so we are using studio right are we also using that yeah, we're also using it here, so we'll keep it here. We'll also, oops, bring it in here. And everything still works. So let's add a new module called quiz. And name it in our um, library to say the, the bits, so this lib.rs is basically where we start looking for stuff. So it's got things in here saying these modules exist. And the quiz function is going to live in the quiz module. And that's also going to need to bring in the right trait. And probably some more stuff in a minute. And we didn't import it in main. So we can do quizzer, quiz, quiz, like so. And quiz needs to be a public function. All right, so uh, everything still works. And now we can write tests for add and quiz in the add and quiz modules. So we've done a bit of work in here. We've got a couple of tests to cover it. Um, so we're testing basically everything that the run command does, apart from, I guess, the failure mode, which we could also include um, if we wanted to. Um, we're not testing this because we could test some of this in some ways. Like we could test that clap is really working or whatever, but it doesn't seem worth it. Uh, and like use of stood out is untestable in a kind of unit test world. I mean, 
almost untestable. You could write, obviously, you could write tests for the entire executable, but I don't feel the need. I feel like all our logic's being covered in here. So let's think about what add should do and how we're going to test that. So um, this is pleasing now that the we were about to get a bit cluttered with tests for add as well as um, run, but now we can do it all separately in a separate module. So um, I guess add is going to ask, is going to listen for your answers. You're going to interact with add. So we're going to say something like add um, accepts a question and answers. Now my understanding was all questions have four answers, right? And this is like make this is like an exam or something. So having like a uniform format like that doesn't seem unreasonable. So we're going to have we're going to call add in this test, and that should be and add is add already takes in stood out. So we'll keep hold of, we'll keep that. And it's going to also, I think, it's going to need to take a stood in, which will be something which we'll define in a minute. And um, we, we're basically going to say, when I give it a bunch of input, it's going to provide a certain output. right? So we know that the output's going to start with Um, it's going to start with like enter a question because we've already done that. But now stood out, it's not just going to look like enter a question. It's going to look like a whole load of stuff. It's going to look more like enter a question and then it's going to probably be enter answer, enter the correct answer. And then this should be new line and then ignore what the new line and the white space that follows me, something like that. That's how I tend to lay out my strings. And then it's going to be enter the first incorrect answer. And then second and third. And then it's going to say something like question, question added, total questions, colon one, I think, something like that. Uh, so that's what we think standard out should look like if we give it this standard in. So standard in is going to look, again, I don't know if this is going to be the right thing, but standard in. So we know that standard output is going to look like um, a new vector. By the way, I never really talked about this so, so function signature for add. Oh, this should be using use super star. I never talked about this function signature. So I started out with impl write. So let's go back to that. So if you write impl write, that is shorthand for this. Right? Uh, that means exactly, pretty much, I think, exactly the same as that. So it means now my function is a generic function. It's generic over some t, which I'm not naming in the other case. And I uh, use T here. So it's a shorthand for that. So what does that mean? It means when I call add with a vec of a U8, like I am in my tests, it creates a version of add that takes a vec of U8s as its argument. And when I call it with stood out, which I do in my real code, it creates another version of add with a vec of stood out. But that's not what we're doing anymore because... Uh, we're now doing a, a mutable pointer to something that is right. And we have to use din here because we have to be able to say 
Um, in order to take in a pointer to something, and we don't know, sorry, beautiful reference. In order to take in a reference to something, we don't know its actual type. We only know that it implements a trait. We have to put the word din there. So it's fine, though. You're allowed to do it. Normally, you'd see a box with din right in it, but it's fine to have a reference that just says, I don't know the exact type of this thing. I just know I've got a reference to it, and it implements right. And that's good enough for us to um, be able to use it. So I could have... I could have done this. And then two versions of add would get created. But if I do it like this, given that I've got a reference anyway, um, actually, I'm not sure I could do that. Let's ask the compiler whether I can do that. Um, it's, uh, it's not... It's not happy. I guess it doesn't know the type. Um, okay, so ignore me. I think I probably couldn't have done that. I, I, I could do the concrete one, but not the reasonable reference. Or I just did something else wrong. I'm distracting myself with something that's not important. So let's say that standard in is... Um, Uh, it's going to be like basically it asks us to enter a question so we're going to enter a question like uh, what is 6 times 8 and then it asks us for the correct answer the correct answer is 48 and then this, the first incorrect answer is 42 um, 49 and 56 uh, and these should all have New lines, I think, because yeah, it's going to read standard out, standard in, and read. It's going to read one line at a time. So here's the input we're going to provide to the add function, and here's the output we expect from it. And now we just need to make add behave like that. So um, I think writing enter a new question to standard out is a reasonable thing to do. But now we need to be able to take in something uh, called std in which is, I guess, maybe it's a mute din read. Let's find out whether that makes any sense. Actually, I think it should be, probably should be a buff read. Let's make it a buff read because we're gonna to need to be able to read lines from it. So we're gonna to need to say something along the lines of, um, let in let lines equal stood in dot lines, I think. And this is going to be an iterator over all the whoops, all the lines in uh, in the input we've been given. So for now, let's just write each line as we get it. Um, so just for learn of line in lines. I've been writing too much TypeScript. I haven't written TypeScript for ages. For learning lines, write, learn, learn. Let's just see what that does. So it should complain at us. Oops, I don't mean make test, I mean cargo test. Um, okay, so we've got a few things going wrong here. So first of all, um, I mean, this is not this is not a buff read, I don't think, and this is not comparable with a vec of u8. So we need to do the same thing we did before, which was make a string from it, and that, like unwrap if that goes wrong. And is stood in a buff read? Surely not. Why am I? Writing Python. <laughs> uh, if you are, I don't know what's happening. Maybe it's too late. Okay, so um, obviously we need to write say where we're writing to, which is the standard app. Um, and it should be like a format string, like this. And 
Oh, a re this is a result. So this learn. So let's just do if let learn. Uh, if let uh, OK learn equals learn. So basically, if it's not OK, I guess we should write something, shouldn't we? Like bad line. Bad line. OK, where are we at? We need to unwrap some of these writes. So the, all these unwraps, by the way, these are all because um, something went wrong with like writing to the console or reading from the console. So when the instructions say you should manage errors, um, errors are handled correctly. Doesn't panic if it encounters any unexpected situation. I'm going to interpret that to mean if we encounter an unexpected situation like um, your standard out went away because you closed your terminal window or something like that. Um, I'm going to panic in those cases. I don't interpret this. I mean errors like as in the user types something unexpected is what I will I will handle. But yeah, we'll see. Okay, so what else? Lines need to be mutable. Yes, it does because it's an iterator. Uh, it's saying a line doesn't need to be mutable. Why not? Why not? How can that not need to be mutable? Let's believe it for now and see how it copes. I guess, yeah, we're making the iterator. No, I'm really surprised at that. What is, what is, oh, hang on. It doesn't know what lines, it, it doesn't know what lines is, does it? Yeah, maybe it does. All right, so in the real code, we're, par we're not passing in a stood in and also something up here with um, okay so we're not passing in the right type of thing here so stood in we've just made it be a string and actually it should be a buff reader buff buff I think it's called buff reader can we make one out of a string let's see oh, I wish my command line I wish my errors were appearing in my editor. Um, it doesn't know about buff reader because we need to import buff reader. Fine. Stood IO buff reader with the right number of colons. Um, Okay, so a, a stra is not read. So let's go and have a look at what is read. So we can make a buffered reader out of it. Just like we did for write. So let's look up the read trait. And see who implements read. Um, a lines implements read, but I don't think that's what we want. An IO slice, maybe? A bytes. A bytes implements read. So in this case, I think a bytes is what we want. Because I think if we just say this is, oops, this is a byte string, is that good enough? Or do we need to say dot bytes or something? Uh, a slice. What? Okay, so an ampersand str is not a, a reader, and a a b and then double quoted string that is a like array of bytes. So um, there's either a bytes method we can call, or should that be as bytes or something? Let's see what that says. Not quite there, let's see. Um, okay, it uh, looks happier because it's now complaining about main not passing in a standard in, which is good. 
Um, what else is it moaning about? Uh, it's surely a buff read. Uh, surely a buff reader of slice of u8 is buff read. I may be confused about my types. Let's have a quick look at that. So let's look up buff reader. Maybe I got the wrong type of thing. A buff reader adds buffering to any reader. And it implements buff read. So that all seems fine. But I'm asking for a buff read which has no type on it. So what is a what is buff read? What is a buff read? Oh look, here's an example. They're making a buff reader from a file. Um, which is so the file is read, so you can make a buff reader out of it. And I presume it can read it just reads bytes, yeah, yeah. So what is our problem? Why are you unhappy? Oh, because we're not passing in a reference to our buff reader. That's all it was. I uh, see. I thought it was something important, but it's not at all. This should be a mutable reference to stood in. And of course, this should be a mutable reference to stood out as well. And while we're here, let's fix main because now we need to pass in a mutable reference to stood in. Which is going to be stood in is going to work very similar to stood out like this. So this is the real stood in, we're passing it into run. Run is going to need to take it, which is going to take in a mutable reference to a dynamic buff read. Now, because it's a buff read, is stood in already a buff read? I think it might be. Let's let's find out. Um, okay, let's start at the top. Still saying that lines doesn't need to be mutable, so let's just stop it being mutable to just stop it complaining about that because it's taking up our space. And I feel like in a minute we're going to figure out maybe we should have done into it here. No, I thought lines already was. I thought lines already was an iterator. Anyway, we'll get there. So um, in add line thirty-five, we can't borrow stood in as mutable. Maybe it shouldn't be mutable. Should it be mutable? Can you read from a buff reader without... Where are we in? Um, can you read from a read without modifying self? No, it does need to be mutable. So I've done this a bit wrong. This needs to be some kind of... Um, Well, I don't know. Should we just say let mute? That's, yeah, I think it's only just that the stood in needs to be mutable. And stood out needs to be mutable. Uh, the, the string, underlying string isn't going to mutate, but the buff reader is going to kind of move through it. So it's going to change like which bit of it it's pointing at next. So maybe that's okay. All right, buff reader is not imported in main. So let's do that. It's starting to look like there are fewer errors, isn't it? I'm glad at least to have some code formatting in my editor. Fine. So, stood in is not buff read. So we need to wrap it in a buff reader, which we can do. So the reason I want a buff reader is because I want to be able to ask for the lines in it. And if you look at read, read doesn't have that lines method. But if you wrap it up in a buff reader or a buff read, um, like so, a buff read has the lines method, which gives us back a lines, which is an iterator over the lines of this reader. Okay, so I think probably I need to import buff reader. like so. And 
we're not we're not pr passing it in on in main on line thirty two as in in the testy bit. So no, no, not in the testy bit in um, in the real code. We're not passing it through. I guess the tests are also going to complain. So we'll find out about that in a second. So vec does not implement buffer. Oh yeah, we just we're calling this wrong. So this is where's this line forty nine. Yeah, so in our tests, we are not passing in a std in. So um, I guess we can just make something very similar to what we made in our add code to basically make a mutable buff reader, which is just, just constructed from a empty string, I think. Like so, like so. And let's do the same thing for the other test as well. So it should come before stood out, that just feels right to me. So then again, it needs a piece mutable reference to stood in. So you can see we're spending time updating old tests with changed interfaces. And you might think that that's Time spent, we could have been writing the real code, but, um, you know, <laughs> I think it's worth it. Okay, so what have we got here? So we're expecting, this is in our add test. Um, we're expecting that stood out should say all of this stuff. And what it actually says is, the first bit is right. Oh, well, it's not quite right. Should we enter a new question? Um, and then the rest of it is, is basically saying you haven't implemented the code you said you would implement. So that's good. We're, we're nearly there. So instead of just printing out all the lines, we need to essentially pull them in one at a time. So we basically need to say let question equal lines.next. And then we need to print something out. So we can do it like this. Um, enter a new question. Whoops. Enter a new question, and then this should be, um, what did we say it should say? Enter the correct answer. And that's going to be correct answer. And then we're going to do enter the first wrong answer. Did we say wrong or incorrect? Incorrect. Enter the first incorrect answer. I could spell that. So this is going to be incorrect answer one. So I guess we maybe want a vec of incorrect answers. Let's mute incorrect answers. No, we want we want this to be a fixed size. So what I, I think we've got two options. We either make an array and we just know that the first one is always the correct one, or we just explicitly say there are four different things. And I feel like. I'm feeling today like we should just have, oh no, no, but what if we change our mind about how many answers we want? All right, let's do this, let's do this the cool way. Const uh, num answers equals four. And then we'll make an array of incorrect answers. It's going to be an array of uh, length num answers minus one, and the the they're going to we're going to seed them with just um, an empty string for the moment, and then every time we read in an answer. 
So this is going to be mutable. Every time we read in an answer, incorrect answers, bracket zero should be that. Something like this. I mean, we, we there's going to be all kinds of different ways that we could structure this. But this is one way. I already kind of hate it. If we if it really gets in our way, we'll kind of realize this was a bad design. Then we don't need to loop through these lines anymore. That was just that. And then we need to print something out at the end to say that we're finished. like this should there be a full stop let's say no because it get, it's going to be confusing it's going to look like one dot when it should be just one so maybe our test will pass now that we've done that so not oh this obviously this is not the right syntax for putting something into an array it should be that um, you have to say the type of something if you make it be a const. Like so. Oh, and incorrect answers. I've done this the wrong way around. Have I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you make an array, the first item is the the thing you're going to put in the array, and the second item after the semicolon is how many how big the array is. So I did it the wrong way around. Okay. Uh, apparently string is not copy, so we can't make an array of string. So we need a vec of string, which I guess makes it easier because um, we don't have to say how big it is, but we can... Uh, or we don't have to fill in um, all the... Uh, um, all the blank strings at the beginning, we can just leave it empty. And then this should be push. Incorrect answers dot push lines dot next. And we do the same thing here and here. And I kind of feel like, is a vec even the right type of thing? Like, isn't it a struct in some way? Lines is not mutable. I told you lines needed to be mutable, didn't I? Okay, now it does. It didn't before with a four because it, it's obviously doing into iter on the thing. Uh, now we're not using any of these variables. And it's complaining about that. Um, so, I mean, we can just give them underscores for their names. But yeah, do we like this vec of size three or do we prefer... This does mean we can change our mind about how many answers we have. So I guess it's okay. I guess it's okay. Okay. Right. Now, we're almost there. So, um, ah, it turns out one of our other tests, the add subcommand test, is now getting a lot more output than it expected. Because, interesting. So, we are... When we call next on lines, yeah, we're obviously getting something back. Um, I'm guessing lines.next, yeah, returns an option, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, okay. So what we actually need to do is check what we get back from here. Um, and return, if not, so we can do, we can use the let else syntax, which is a relatively new thing in Rust. You can say let, and then pattern match, on lines dot next and then and then if a pattern doesn't match we can just return is that what we want to do basically this is this is the situation where uh, standard in is not giving us back any any more lines because it's been closed so i think just returning is a sensible thing to do here does that fix our problem? It does. So that's nice. So we should do the same thing here. Um, well, this should be that. 
and this. No, who's not that? Correct answer. And we can do the same thing. Oh, we're going to lay it out like that, are we? Fine. Um, and now it's going to be if let. Yeah, yeah, we need to do something inside the if now. So it's going to be if let some answer equals that. Do something. Otherwise, return. And what we need to do is push something into here, like so. Now we could we we're going to repeat this code, and we're going to feel bad about it. So why don't we we yeah why don't we loop for something in a range from zero to num answers minus one, like this. Um, we're going to write something out, which is going to be different each time. And so that means we need this. Oh no, wait, let's, let's loop through questions for, I mean, this is prompts, I guess. Prompt in, for prompt in a prompts. Uh, write out the prompt, and then uh, if we get back an answer, put it in our incorrect answers vec, otherwise return. So prompts is going to be some kind of slice of strus, ampersand strus, like this. There's going to be three of them. I mean, we could do better than this, but this feels like, in terms of translations, this is like closer to the string you'd give to your translator, right? So enter the first, second, third correct answer, prompt you with those things. Finally, write out, yeah, that's all done. Now, what's it moaning about? If let. Uh, okay, so prompt is not used because we forgot that we needed to use it here. And we can't use it like that. We have to do a template string. Like so. Because that's what the right learn macro expects. Look, all our tests pass. So just to go over what we did in this code, um, we read in the question, we prompt for a question, read in the question, prompt for an answer, read in the answer. Then we've got three more prompts, and for each one of those, we loop through them and push something into this incorrect answers vec. If we got a line, if we've stopped getting lines because our standard input has been closed because they shut the um, terminal or something, then we'll just return. Um, and all of this is working with an iterator over the lines we've been given by just calling next. Normally you lose an iterator in a for loop, but here we're manually calling next to get the next line. Okay, so our test is passing. Add accepts a question and some answers, but it doesn't save them anywhere. So I guess um, the next thing that we might want to do is um, uh, save those answers somewhere. Like at least store them in in memory or something. I guess the first thing we could do is say that it tells us that we've now got two questions total uh, instead of one. If we do this twice, so that seems fair enough. So let's. This is going to be a nasty long test. Um, in fact, I can shorten this a little bit, can't I? If I just stick all these lines together. That's not too bad, is it? Oops. If we just stick all this stuff together, 
that reads fine. Oh, until the line length goes wrong because I still haven't sorted out my Rust format. So I'll do that later. Okay, so let's do, let's add two questions. Oops, and then let's have it, um, add accepts multiple questions and answers. Um, and I guess it's gonna need to prompt us to say uh, continue or something like this. Continue, Y or N, and then it's going to ask for another question. And we're just going to say yes. When it asks us whether we want to continue, we're going to say yes. And then we're going to type, we're going to do another question. Um, what is six times nine and we all know that the correct answer according to certain authoritative sources is 42 and then some wrong answers might be say banana apple uh, or strawberry like that now this is a very long string so the rust format it doesn't know what to do with it um, even if it otherwise would. So let's help it out a bit. Uh, and actually, I want that Y to kind of stand out, so I'm going to put it on its own line. And then do that. Okay, that seems happy. All right, so that test is going to fail, because now we're it's asking us, do we want to type in... Um, the, yeah... Well, okay, it's asking us uh, one question. We say, yes, I want another one, and then we're entering another one. And we don't have any mechanism to do that. And we certainly don't have a mechanism to say, you've now entered two questions. So let's try that. So only our new test failed, which is good. But I think our old test is going to fail when we start supporting this continue thing. So we want the add function to ask us, do we want to continue? Um, like so. So now if we run it again, it would it will now the previous test will now fail because we're now saying continue. So let's see if we can get that previous test to pass again by saying this. Okay, now our first test passing again, it'll probably fail again in a sec, but we'll see. Okay, so what it needs to do is this all needs to happen in some kind of loop, right? Like this. This function is getting quite long for me to be not breaking it up. So just take that discomfort and let's feel it for a second and see where it, where it leads us. So now we're going to ask for the next line. And Um, it's either going to give us, it's, it's going to be a Y or an N, or it's going to be just a end of and input, in which, in which case we leave. Um, I want to have a to-do here for like to-do save. Save questions. Um, but yeah, uh, if if we they we run out of standard input, we just return. Otherwise, we've got this kind of YN thing, um, and uh, it's going to be a Y or something else. So we're going to just say if YN dot lowercase is not equal to capital Y break. Like break and return mean the same thing here. But return is to basically saying we've run out of standard input, so there's nothing we can do. We must stop right now. And to me, break means like break out of this loop, which of course then immediately leaves. So it feels it feels right to me for those to be different. Now let's see what happens. Um, is it just lower? How do you make a string lower? Okay, so right, Rust. Uh, is it too lower? Uh, 
to lowercase. To lowercase. Try that. Um, oh, hang on, hang on. This YN thing is a result. Um, so this should be... Um, this should be, if it's, if it worked okay. So this is like a double pattern. Is this going to work before I start explaining it? Yes, it did work. Um, yeah, so the next returns an option of result. So we want to say if it's both a sum, as in it's returning something, as in it didn't run out of lines, and also um, IO somehow didn't go wrong, then we got into here, we've got ourselves a string. Now we can do lowercase it and check whether it's capital Y. If it's not capital Y, stop looping. If it is capital Y, run again. So now our test looks very close to what we wanted. Um, so, no, what, yeah, hang on, hang on. Which one's expected and which one's actual? So we're expecting all of this, and the actual we get is shorter. So we ask whether you want to continue, but we don't loop around. Why not? Oh, probably because that Y has got a new line in it. So I think there's a trim, or is it strip? Some languages trim, some languages strip. Um, some, probably something else. How about that? Okay, we better print out this YN, hadn't we? It's a small Y. Oh, hang on, I'm too lower casing it, and then I'm comparing it with an uppercase Y. That is not going to work. Okay, we'd look a lot closer now. So um, I think it's all the same, except total question says two at the end instead of one. Now, there's two ways we could do this. There's a cheating way and a non-cheating way. Um, we could just count how many times you've gone around this loop and then print out the number, and that would be the test-driven... I guess that is the test-driven way. Make this test pass by being dumb, and then we'll make it clever later. All right, so we're going to have a count of questions. And once we've done it, we're going to increment the count. And then we're going to print total questions count. And now our test should pass. No, it does not. Oh, wow, we're still printing out um, this, which we don't need anymore. And we don't pass because... Oh, wait, it asks us again whether we want to continue. So that seems right to me. So we just got our test wrong. Should look like this. Okay, so um, our, our code is looking good. I would definitely do a git commit at this point. Um, uh, but yeah, it's now able to ask us two questions, and soon we're going to store these questions, which is what this to do is, instead of just pretending we have by counting. So we're going to take another break there. And we're back, and I think it is high time that we tried out this code to make sure that it actually works. So let's cargo run. Um, add. And it will ask us for a question, so let's say x plus y correct answer is obviously z incorrect answers might be six five and four added a question and let's say no to con let's say yes to continue uh, new question p q r s t continue no okay so the, the, it does work like it, the, like it's really common with test driven development especially testing something a bit weird like this input and output stuff that um it doesn't actually work the way you um hoped it would 
Um, so definitely worth trying out. Anyway, it does seem to work. So it seems like we're on the right track with how we're testing this stuff. Um, we've got it asking us multiple questions. Um, and the, the question now is, how do we make it actually store stuff um, to a file? We can either write a test that kind of checks that um, it stores stuff to a file, or we can um, like only test the kind of externally visible behavior, which is that after you've added some questions, um, you can then like find some questions when you when you ask it to. Um, I think in this case it would be fine for us to. I think like the fact that there's some stuff in the file is like an observable feature of this program, so we should test that. So let's think about what our test might look like. Um, so we're going to do something similar to this, but we're going to kind of assert that something ends up in the file. So new questions oops, are stored in the quiz JSON. Let's just say that. That's pretty clear, isn't it? And actually, we're going to copy this because we want, we're going to have multiple questions. So we're going to, we're no longer going to care about what it prints to stand it out because we've already tested that somewhere else. What we're going to say is, if I give you this information about these questions and answers, and let's just make this one have a space in it just to be absolutely sure that's um, that's working. Um, so we still need to pass in stood out. It's just that we're not going to look at look at it. Um, and we're also going to need to pass in some kind of thing which represents our JSON file. So we're going to have let probably immutable JSON file equal something. And at this point, I'm starting to think like there's a stood in, there's a stood out. Um, really, it probably should be like the outside world as an object that we pass in. Um, so let's let's make a struct that represents that, and then see how it goes. So um, I should I could call this environment or IO. I mean, I.O. is already taken as one of the standard library names, so it'd have to be something else like that. Um, uh, what does it call it in the question? It talks about user input uh, being separate from logic. Uh, no, like... Sorry, no, it talks about logic concerning lo creating, storing, and loading quiz questions is defined in the library. So it's not quite the, the, the split that we want. All right, so let's just call this... Um, um, let's just call it environment. I mean, it, it's a bit confusing because there's such a thing as an environment variable, um, but then environment variables would get defined in, in our environment, I think, if... If we were using them, which we're probably not. Okay, so we're going to have a thing called environment. Maybe we'll change our minds and um, um, uh, think of a better name for it. But for now, we'll call it environment. Uh, it's going to be a trait, isn't it? Um, and basically, it's going to be able to... Well, there's different ways we could do this. We could either say, like, give me your standard in and give me your standard out and then do stuff. Or we could do, um, we could have methods on it like uh, read read and write um, so that it's all kind of very separated out from the, the code that uses it. What do we want to do? It's definitely going to have, it's definitely going to have, like, um, you know, save save to a file, or maybe save save to our quiz file. Um, 
I think I like the idea of it just of it just having methods like um, read stood in line. Like this, it's going to be. It's going to take a mutable reference to self and return a string. So basically, um, tell me, you know, give me a thing from standard in. Oh, I guess that'll be an option of string, won't it? Because we might have finished reading stood in, and then I guess there's also going to be right stood stood outline. Um. And I guess that is going to return unit, and it's going to take in, it's probably going to take in format args. So let's just look up format args um, so I can remember what I'm talking about. Something like this, maybe? Yeah. So this is basically going to allow us to pass in arguments that. Um, get used like you're doing um, print learn or something like that. So basically it means that you can uh, you can hey, this may not be what I want. Yeah, that's what I want. So I can use the format command if I've passed in a format args. It looks like this. So I think I, I want to be able to pass in a format args so that I can later call format on it. Um, the alternative is I could just I could just require you when you send stuff in to call format and just pass in a string. Maybe that's simpler. Um, it returns, okay, it returns a format arguments. So I guess the question is, I felt like we needed to do this, I think maybe just for efficiency. Um, but the question is, why is that better than just taking in a string? So this is the one, this, this is what gets used inside these other macros. So maybe if I was writing a macro, I'd need it, and maybe I don't particularly need it. I think I'm making my life overcomplicated. I think I'll just say um, that we're going to take in a string. Or even maybe a str. No, let's say a string, because we're going to we're going to use format to construct it normally, so that'll be fine. And then we're also going to do this new thing, which is read quiz json. Um, which I mean, may I may not even need a mutable reference to self to do that. No, let's let's keep it consistent. We'll see. And that's going to give us back. Let's say it gives us a string, right? So we're not going to do the kind of JSON parsing logic inside here. We're just going to say, get hold of um, the contents of the file, and then. Um, We'll also be able to write into the file. Now, if it returns unit, I don't need to write it, so I can just write that. Okay. So I think a trait like that, and then it's going to get implemented by a um, a real environment, um, and then which we're basically not going to test. It's just going to be quite dumb, and then it's going to be implemented by some kind of fake environment, which is what we'll use in our tests, which is going to look similar to the the fakes that we've already been making. It's all going to kind of wrap this stuff up into something um, a bit simpler. And it's it's right that these things come together. You're not going to want a fake standard in and a real standard out at the same time. You're just going to want a whole fake environment. So it kind of makes sense to me. So let's try and make a real environment. Well, let's think about Let's make sure we're doing this right by thinking about what the code would look like if we do this. So... Um, in here, 
we're going to make a real environment. Let env equal um, environment, no, real environment, new. And I think we'll, we'll let the constructor of real environment do, whoops, create these standard out and standard in objects. And then we're just going to pass in immutable reference to end. So I think this looks good from this point of view. Um, so these are going to these are going to move. Um, and then this is just going to get passed through. Um, yeah, okay, and we, we basically, this buff read stuff, we've made easier now because that buff read is all going to be done inside the environments. So we've made our lives a bit simpler, although we are going to kind of write that code twice, which we, well, we've already written it twice because we had to do. Yeah, so I think that's okay. I guess I want to, um, yeah, I think this just makes everything simpler and better, but we'll see. Um, we'll see. So we're going to pass on the environment. The point of this is that the reason I'm doing this now is I'm about to add the reading and writing to a file thing, and it would have been like a third and fourth argument to these functions, which was just starting to look a bit heavy. And then here we're going to do... See, it is making our life simpler. We're going to do... Let env equal fake environment like this, and these in a second are going to go away, and we just pass in our fake environment. Now it feels a little bit like this is almost too easy, um, and then here. We're going to need, okay, so the fake environment is going to need the ability to ask for the standard out, I guess. So we can just say, and that'll be a method on fake environment, not on, um, not on the environment trait. And basically the same thing here. Like so. Okay, so it's looking okay for main. Now let's, let's think about how add is going to look. So add's just going to take in a mutable reference, whoops, a mutable reference to an environment. Did I put din before? Yes, I did. Okay, so again, we're taking in a trait. But it's okay, we're allowed to do that because we're taking in a reference to it. If we were taking in a concrete type, we would, that wouldn't be allowed. We'd need to have it in the box or something like that. But because it's a trait, we have to have the word in here to say um, this isn't a, a real thing. Uh, well, rather, we don't know the concrete type of this thing. Um, and now here, instead of having this, calling this lines method, that's going to happen inside the environment. Every time we read something, we're going to say, oh, this should be called environment, env, shouldn't it? We're just going to say env dot, env dot, um, read stood in line, stood in, like so. And whenever we write something out, it's just going to be env dot write stood out line um, and in this case uh, maybe making it a string was a bad idea because we have to own it now or like make it do a two owned on it so maybe right stood outline should take a reference to a string or maybe this is fine or we could do we could have two methods that take the two different things where that feels like overkill. I think I'm gonna live with it like this. Um, it's not too bad. It's it's 
Um, it's a little bit of kind of noise here, but it's pretty clear what's going on, isn't it? And then we can just replace the lines dot next with this. Oh, no, oh, I missed out the dot next there. Uh, and then this is going to do something similar. And it's going to, the writing is going to do the same kind of thing as this. So this is actually prompt. This is actually improved, hasn't it? You can just say prompt.2 right here. It's nice. Um, and then we got a bit more writing out to do down here. No. I often type W to select a word when I mean double quote to select the whole quoted string. Okay, so last one. Um, and then one more read stood in. And now just some tests to fix. Um, we haven't actually made our fake um, uh, environment. Okay, uh, so now stood in and stood out need to actually um, uh, we need to, a way of saying there's some stood in here. So it's going to be let n equal fake environment colon colon um, like with stood in or something like that, right? And then we'll give past this. And again, this is just a method on the fake thing. Um, so we don't have to implement that on the trait. That's an immutable reference to env, which means that env needs to be mutable. I guess I've missed that earlier as well. Um, and then here, this is just going to be env dot stood out. It's going to be that. And then same again. But with a different string. Um, okay, I think that's about right. Pass it in the environment. And this stood out for the environment should look like this. Now, we've probably got a load of bugs here, so let's just try and now get... Oh, no, we've got one more to do. Okay. Um, oh, this is the new test, wasn't it? So, this is going to look like... Again, same thing, create an environment with that standard input. Um, don't need a standard output, don't need a JSON file. And pass in that reference to that environment. And then we need to do some kind of assert. Um, the end, the file, the JSON, the quiz file. Which is going to be somehow stored inside our fake environment, it's going to come out looking like, uh, well, something. Um, I'm not quite sure. Like, it's going to be some JSON, and it's going to have some questions in it. 
I tell you what, I want to do. I want to do it with the JSON macro, which um, is provided by Serdy JSON. So it's going to look something like uh, questions are going to be an array of. Um, objects. This object is going to be things like, uh, I guess we should just call the property question. What is six times eight? And then correct answer. I think I'll just follow the same structure. Like I chose this structure in my code that look like this. So, um, and then incorrect answers. So we liked it before. Let's just trust ourselves that this is a good shape for this data. 42, 49, 56. I mean, they could, that could all fit on one line, right? Yeah, okay, there we go. So that looks like a decent shape for a question. And no comma at the end. And then this one. And we're going to, a few things are going to um, come through here. Like we're going to make sure there's no trailing new lines or anything in our. Um, our stuff here, apple, strawberry. And it just fits on one line, so we don't need to modify the answers to make it fit. All right, so we, we've got a load of work to do now to make this fake environment look right, make the real environment look right, um, before any of our tests are gonna pass. So we've done a big, a big refactoring. We're halfway through a big refactoring here, probably bigger than I would like, but I'm not sure how to make it smaller. Um, Okay, uh, and this, I was just noticing the question is unused and so soon that's, that's not gonna be the case, so that's good. Okay, so let's write a real environment to make sure that our interface makes any sense. So we're gonna make a, a module called real environment. Like so. And it's going to implement environment, if I could spell it, like so. And if I was really lucky, my editor would offer to fill in the details, but that's clearly not happening. And also, we're going to need to provide at least a new method on real environment. And probably we're going to hold on to some other stuff, but... It returns a self. And for now, let's just have it return self, and self's got nothing in it. So to implement an environment, we need to implement these methods. At least one of which we won't bother really implementing yet. But um, Now, this is untested code, so we've got to be super careful with it. Um, but I think what we want to do is self.studyin. Uh, I mean, I guess let's call it stood in lines. We're going to hold on to stood in as a, a lines wrapper around it, I think. Dot next. I think that will be good enough. Um, unless that returns a result. That might return a result. In, in which case, I think it will, yeah. That's fine. Let's figure it out. But let's assume it's going to return a result. Um, failed. Reading stood in. So before we did an unwrap here for if something went wrong when we were reading from stood in, um, just because we're writing a uh, sort of a little library now, we're going to be a little bit more explicit and say um, something went wrong when we were reading stood in in a way that means people can see that error when when we crash. We're still going to crash. I still think that that's legitimate error handling. Um, but we're gonna ha we're gonna need to think about our error handling towards the end because if we've done no code that that really handles useful errors, um, we haven't really implemented the exercise because they told us to do decent error handling. So 
Um, <clears throat> I was expecting to come up against some error conditions that, that require us to handle them that are not just like uh, you failed to read from Studin, but we'll see. Okay, so that means that we're going to need a, um, a Studin lines function. I mean, actually, I think this should just be a property on the real environment. So real environment is going to have this thing called studying lines, and the type is going to be, it's going to be like a lines of something, I think. We're going to have to figure that out in a second. Um, and we're going to create it by getting hold of um, the actual studying by calling stood in, which is from, I think it's stood IO, stood in. I think that was it. So we're getting hold of the real stood in, and then we're going to wrap it in a buff reader. And then we're going to call lines on it. And I think we can do all of that, and then just, it will still own that stood in buff reader. So stood in lines um, kind of owns the, the stood in object. So if I'm right, that's going to be okay. And the type of this is going to be to be determined. So can we get anything useful out of the compiler to help us with that? Um, all right, so we've got a load of just busy work to do first. So we need to use... Um, we need to do a load of importing and stuff like that. So add no longer uses those buff reads, which is kind of nice. Okay, what's next? Ah, well, we didn't add environment to our list of modules. Um, and we didn't add real environment. And soon we're going to need fake environment, but we haven't done that yet. Okay, so real environment it doesn't. Okay, so we are. It is checking real environment. So we have got the reasonably close to where we want the help from our compiler. Um, let's just have this. Since this returns something, we should probably just make it return something. I guess we could just put in a to do. If you put in to do, um, then it doesn't matter what this thing returns. Um, to do is. Uh, it knows that to do is going to like stop your program, so it doesn't care about what you return. And the fancy language for that is to do returns the never type, i.e., never returns, and never type type checks are the same as anything. Um, now, which one of these do I need? We definitely need a buff reader. We got rid of a buff reader a minute ago, didn't we? So let's put our buff reader in. Um, oh, these should be gathered together. Like so. Um, and what does lines on a buff reader return? That's what we need to know, isn't it? So that we can get somewhere here. Should have a lines method. Right. Um, stood IO lines looks like it might be the right thing. Iterator over, oh yeah, oh, it's buff read, not buff reader, which provides a lines method. So it looks like stood IO lines is what I want. So let's try that. Because the reason why buff reader has a lines method is because it's a buff read. Buff read is the trait. Buff reader is the um, struct, I guess. Okay, so um, all right, we need to use environment in <clears throat> real environment. Use create. I always spell that um, create when I mean create. Use create environment environment, which means that environment needs to be pub. 
All right, what's next? A load of more stuff. Oh yeah, lines uh, needs to be a lines of something. In this case, it is a lines of buff reader, I guess. Um, let's just recheck the documentation one more time. So when we call buff reader, it implements buff read. And buff read has a lines method. Somewhere here, no? I guess if we look here, we'll find it. And it returns a lines of self. So I think that means it's going to return a lines of buff reader of, I think maybe stud.io or something like that, and where stud.io is. No, stood in. I mean. I think the type of stood in. We're calling the stood in method here. Um, I think the type of that is stood in, but let's. We're getting a bit complicated here, aren't we? I might be wrong about what it needs at all. Okay, so it's complaining about something in add. Um, I I guess oh here we are, here we are. Method not found in buff reader of stood in. Okay, it is a buff reader of stood in, so that's good. I did guess that part right. Um, but there's no lines method on the buff on a buff reader. That's kind of surprising, isn't it? Ah, it's because I need to bring in that trait, but buff read trait. Yeah, okay, so this is one of the, I would say, one of the real wrinkles of Rust, that some methods are not available unless you bring in the trait which provides them. So even though we've got a buff reader, and even though buff reader does implement buff read, we're not able to call lines on it until we actually bring in that buff read trait. And it does, the compiler does tell us what to do, so maybe it's okay. Um... Now we got this part wrong, obviously. So we've got hold of a lines. We call next on it, and it's expecting us to return an option of string, but we have somehow got hold of a result. Um, <clears throat> ah, yeah. Okay. So I think we've got an option of result. Okay. So we're going to be able to show off some cool thing that we can do here. So. Let's let's make this really explicit, right? So let's um, x, which is an option, just to be sure that I'm right. Option of result of string, comma, std io error. I think that's what this is. Um, and that is going to be what we get back from next. And then we're doing the wrong thing here by we're using the expect on the option. We want to do the expect on the result. So let's see. Um, are we right? Uh, oh, well, no, because I've typed it wrong. Um, need another diagonal bracket here. Oops. Uh, see, you can see now why... Um, there's too much, uh, this refactor is far too big because I've got broken stuff all over the place and I'm only trying to focus in on one bit. So we're supposed to be returning option of string. So basically it's saying that line was okay. This is the line that's the problem. So we are right that it's an option of result. And it turns out there's a beautiful method um, called transpose which does exactly what we need. So the type that we'll get back from this is going to be a result. But instead of a string in here, it's going to be an option in here. Like so. Um, and that's exactly what we want. So basically transpose makes an option of result into a result of option. And now we ought to be able to do what we want to do. And then we can shorten this code a little bit. Um, 
Oh, this, yeah, I forgot to make this do it on Y. So hopefully that will now work. Yeah, it's not complaining about that anymore. Yeah, so that worked. So now we can shorten this a lot, right? We can just say... Um, next dot transpose dot expect. So hopefully that was that was clear. Basically, um, stood in lines is a um, a lines object, which it is an iterator. So you call next on it to get the next one, and that uh, returns you because iterators always return you an option of something. Um, so in this case, it returns as an option of result of string, and the reason is. Um, option means like you've run out of input in your iterator, but result is because we're doing some I/O here. So like there might be some problem with reading from um, from standard input. So there's some kind of error possible. So we don't we want to return the option. We want to express the fact that may, you may have finished reading standard in, but we want to deal with the result, the the error potential error right here. So we swap them over and we say. Right, it's either either something went wrong with reading, or um, maybe we just finished reading. And finished reading is fine, but if something went wrong, we want to panic with this error message. And then, what? So, so our result of option has now been with this expect has now been reduced to just an option, which we can return. Um, so that's a like it's an oddness of using this lines object, which we created by calling lines, which is an iterator that kind of tries to. Um, make reading lines from a um, an input stream simple, but it can't take away the fact that there might something might go wrong each time you try and read in a line. So it has to return uh, not just um, an iterator over strings, but an iterator over results of strings, which is why we end up in this mess. But now the code looks like nothing particularly special is going on. So is that good or bad? I don't know. Anyway, that part is hopefully working, and we can move on to the next error. So. Next error is in the add, we are we should be calling to string I think instead of to owned on this thing. Let's have a quick look. So um, we've got these prompts which are ampersand strus, and we're calling to owned on them, um, and the, that's not for some reason because these are ampersand strus. To owned is like not giving us the thing we want. So if we call to string, I think that will. I think it's somehow like to owned, like it's saying, well, you already own this reference. So, um, yeah. Not sure why sometimes to owned, on, a, on a, just a string literal here, you could call to owned and it would give you a string. Um, maybe because that's here, it's technically a str, not an ampersand str. And here it's an ampersand str. Not sure, not sure. Okay. Anyway, I think uh, just doing what the compiler tells us will make it happy. And now, what else? Um, on line 41, it is saying, uh, read stood in line gave us back a string, because that's what read stood in line returns. And, oh, sorry, an option of string. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we've done the handling of the error case already. Um, Inside read stood in line. Um, now we might change our mind on this if we want to. If we decide later we want to expose that, that result, but for now we've already handled the fact that it might fail inside read stood in line, so we don't need to handle it here. So we can get rid of that matching on the OK. That means that in the error case before we would have returned, and now we're panicking. So we've actually changed the behaviour here. Uh, we'll see whether we're OK with that. Um, ah, now. Um, if we're not using count, I have broken something because our tests are definitely not going to pass. How did I manage to delete? We are using count. Okay, let's see. Something else has gone wrong here. Right? Um, that's that's really weird, isn't it? Assigned to but never used. Um, ah, look. This is why. This is why. This what the code we wrote here is not right. We need to format that. Thank goodness for um, Rust noticing unused code, huh? So yeah, we um, we were just passing in a string literal with the with the brackets count inside it, uh, 
because we forgot that we needed to use format to actually substitute in there. Okay. Now, well, let's just start the first error. So first of all, it's warning us in real environment that these things are unused, so let's just suppress those warnings for now so that we don't have to read them over and over. Like, oops, like this. Uh, what next? New is never used. It definitely is, but I didn't make it public, so um, probably we couldn't see that no, uh, people were trying to use it. Now, inside main, we're using environment, but we're not actually importing it, so let's do that. By the way, if you don't like um, these like environment colon colon environment stuff here, you can do stuff inside lib to make it um, like expose environment directly as if it was defined in here. But I, I like the explicitness of like it's in a submodule. If if I was writing a library for some other or someone else to use, I'd probably want environment to be just inside Quizzer. But it just feels like an extra layer of complication that I don't want to deal with, so I won't bother with it for now. Now, inside main, we're somehow writing to stood out when we shouldn't be, because we forgot a place. So let's look at that. Yeah, here. So here we should be saying environment, or env dot, um, it's write stood out line. Um, this. And that will swallow errors for us, so we don't need to unwrap here. Okay, so that was quite a few things fixed. Um, still warning that uh, real environment is not used. I'm sure it is, but we must be messing that up somewhere. Main no longer needs the right um, import. And surely it doesn't need the buff read either. We'll see whether that complains. Oh yeah, no, it was saying we don't, yeah. Okay, so now it's saying inside main you're using real environment but you haven't imported it. So that's why it's complaining that real environment um, new is not being used because we haven't actually imported here. So we bring that in um, and then here on line 35 we need to pass in... No, what's it saying? Okay, we haven't fixed quiz. Yeah, quiz should be taking in an environment as well. Uh, oh, quiz we just haven't done at all. So use create environment. Oops. Environment. And we should be, and this should, we should call this env. And we should do env dot write stood outline this stuff. To owned like that. Okay, now what else? Still not using real environment new. Ah, oh, because real environment is not pub. Um, and can't borrow that as mutable because we didn't declare it as mutable, I guess. So this should be let mute env. And have we used, have we done this? No, we haven't. Yeah, we've almost done that stuff, so we don't need to remember it there. Okay. Look, it works. It doesn't surely pass yet or work properly. Um, or all our test code is just a disaster area. Or you can definitely do what it says there for a start. Again, like this is just far too long for, whoops, um, for me to have broken code. Like I shouldn't have, somehow I should have found a way to make this refactoring less painful. Um, don't need buff reader anymore. Is that what it's saying? Yeah. 
we haven't even implemented something called fake environment yet. Um, so that's, that's why it's complaining about that. But first, let's make sure real environment is correct because this is untested code, so we need to think carefully about it. So we're pretty sure that this, this is okay for reading from standard input. We definitely need to write to standard output. So I guess this will be right then standard out text. I think it might be as simple as that. I think probably not, because I think it, it this will need to be a format string, which makes me think I've done this a slightly odd way, but I think we'll get away with it. Maybe it needs a reference to standard out, we'll see. Now, we won't do the reading and writing um, to a real file yet because we haven't we haven't thought about that stuff yet. But this should be okay. So now, in order for this to work, we need to have a stood out here. But I think it's just going to be much simpler than the input. It's just going to be a stood out. So we're going to make sure that we've got the methods we want to call and the types we're going to use imported, and then to create one, we're just going to call the method. So these methods stood in and stood out, they basically mean give give me an object which I can use to read from stood in and write to stood out. And this is how they work. Now what's it running about? We need to have we need the uh, ability to write in here. Oh, I guess this should go in here too. Like so. Now, what was it? Is that all it's moaning about? Still doesn't like. Oh, yeah, just that that might go wrong. Um, oh, and I imported that in the wrong place. So, first of all, let's just handle the fact that writing to stood out might go wrong. Now, providing an error message to write when writing to standard out went wrong seems a little odd, doesn't it? Um, because where's it going to get written? Failed writing to stood out. So, yeah. I don't know if we want to handle errors. We'll see. If if we do, we'll need to think about how we're going to test that as well. All right, so let's fix this thing too. So, whoops. In, did I do something weird there? I don't know. In add, we're, we're importing uh, JSON... Sadly, Jason, we only need it in tests. So this should be fine. And that's moaning that we don't have a fake environment yet. So let's make a fake environment. Fake environment. And before we do anything else, let's make sure it gets included here. like this, and you can see it over there, and it's going to be a struct, public struct, obstruct fake environment, which uh, definitely has an import block, and it's going to import environment, like so. It's going to be creatable with, I think we had a new, didn't we? Which returns a self. And um, we're going to need all the methods from environment. And we're going to need the fake stuff that we created. Did I hopefully comment it out? No, I thought my memory was better than it is. So we're going to have something called standard in, which is going to be, um, well, previously we basically used, um, uh, just a, a reference to a str, I think. So I guess we're going to have a buff reader wrapped around a string. 
maybe. Let's have see how do we use it? We pass in just a str. And then we expect to be able to just bring it out line by line. So hopefully this is gonna work. So buff reader view of um I guess in this case is it it's an well I think we should call I think instead of creating ourselves here we should call uh with we, we decided there's gonna be a method called with stood stood in with stood in uh of an empty string and then we'll we'll create that. So this is gonna be a public function, isn't it? So pub fun with I think it was with stood in. What did we call it? Let's let check. Yeah, with stood in. With stood in. Which takes in a um, text, let's call it, to be sure that we're not overlapping names. Returns a self. And the self it returns has a stood in it. Which is going to be a buff reader. New. That's kind of wrapping um, something that we've this text that we've converted to an, an, an own string, so we can actually own the text of it inside that buff reader. Um, and then when we read from it, buff reader has a lines. All right, so it's actually going to be a lines, isn't it? Um, so that means we need to bring in a few things. Use std io. We're definitely going to need um, buff reader and buff read, so we can call the lines method and lines. I think they're all instead I/O, aren't they? Um, so we're going to call lines on it. So this looks very similar to the um, the real environment, which kind of makes me think um, we should we should be like testing the code that does this work since we're doing it in the real environment and the fake environment. So let's think about that in a second. Maybe we're just, like I like this interface. I don't want to mess that up. So, but maybe we could um, write some kind of utility function and test that. Um, all right, and I actually think read stood in line is going to look the same. This is really worrying, isn't it? Um, like there's something, there's some abstraction we're missing here. Um, let's rename this to stood in lines so that it really looks the same. Um, yeah, definitely there's some abstraction we're missing here. Uh, this should never happen. Um, so, should never happen. Because we're reading from We've made a buff reader around a string, so we should never get an I.O. error doing that. Error reading string. I mean, from, you know, something like that. So I want to, I, if something should really never happen, I want to make sure we say that, because if I'm wrong about that, I want to know about it. Okay, where have we got to with this? Um, so, fake environment hasn't been imported, I guess, and, um, yeah, we need to import it. Uh, but only in the test area, because only the tests are doing this. I mean, arguably, fake environment shouldn't even be defined outside of config test. Should we do that? I think I can do that with this. How do we think about that? This exclamation mark means like apply not to the thing next after me, but to this entire thing I'm inside. Oh no, I think, is that okay? I should probably also do this, do it here. Which kind of makes the other thing redundant, but I feel like it's worth having. Okay, so it's it's happy about that. It's just saying fake environment doesn't 
import environment. So we can do that. Okay, where have we got to? Where have we got to? Lots of errors in fake environment, I think. Um, all right, yeah, we didn't provide, we haven't yet provided a stood out method on the fake environment. Fair enough. We'll just put a to do in there for now. Um, because we haven't done anything to do with stood out yet in that fake environment. Now in main, we haven't imported fake environment. So let's do that. Only in the test world. Um, I'm wondering now, I'm in main. Okay, so in order to use the fake environment in main, uh, fake environment actually needs to be part of the um, exported interface of the crate. So we cannot restrict it to be only available in test, which is fine. I don't think there's any harm in it exporting a fake environment, which we can then use somewhere else. Because the point is, this is, this is using stuff from... The, this main world, the world of main is outside of the library, the quizzer library. So to use stuff from it, it needs to be um, exposed in its interface, which I'm fine with. Um, it can be really annoying to see that a crate has implemented some fakes that are really useful for testing, but you can't get hold of them because they're only defined in config test. So why not just export them, make them part of our interface we share with other people and then they can use them for their tests okay all right so first of all you can't make a string and then just expect to be able to read it now i think i saw oh yeah we had need to do an as bytes on it so where is that um I mean, so I think we don't need two string. We need as bytes instead, and that's it, that turns it into some bytes that we own. I think. Um, and I forgot to make stood out. Look how it should look. It should look like this. A method, not an associated function. Uh, what else? Yeah, and bytes uh, bytes will give us a slice of buffer reader. Um, oh, this doesn't look like as bytes doesn't look like we get back something we own. So this might not work. But let's see. Let's see. Um, it's going to maybe make some really weird errors. Yeah, yeah, it's a reference to thing. It doesn't. We don't own it. It's no good. It's all right. So. Um, this is making me question my whole thing. If buff, if this buff reader is not going to own this thing, what if it was a bytes? I think there is a bytes object that's part of the standard library. I don't know whether as bytes is going to return something we can turn into bytes or what. How do we get hold of a bytes? Let's look it up. Okay, bytes is a thing. I think it's this bytes that we want. The bytes method on a struct gives us back a bytes. But it's a bytes, yeah, it's, it doesn't actually own the thing. So I think... Yeah, I want something that's like an owned bytes. So I guess I want a, like a vec of u8. Can I do that? Something like that, maybe? Um, let's see. Really, really unhappy. Um, I mean, read, so read's not implemented by a vec of u8. 
Let's see what does implement read. I think it, like a slice would implement read. Um, I mean, a buff reader implements read, but we need something that, that, that we can provide to our buff reader. Yeah, so the difficulty here is that I want to own something and then iterate over its lines. Um, and string does not implement read. Or lines, like if string implemented lines, then that would be okay, wouldn't it? We've got as bytes or bytes. So if we just call bytes, maybe that will help us instead of as bytes. Because maybe that thing that we return, or like we want some kind of into bytes, right? Oh no, or, or maybe this iterator, maybe we can just call it lines on our string. So the, the ownership issues are what's getting me here. We need to hold on to something that owns um, the thing it's iterating over. So maybe just a lines of string was the simple thing we wanted. Maybe. I was definitely going to need to be a buff reader. Um, so I've, I've messed that up at least. Oh no, well it's not, no, no. Okay, we don't even need a buff reader. Okay, so maybe this is why we're not sharing code between these these two environments because um, we probably don't need that transpose stuff now because I don't think it'll return a result. Let's see whether this whether I've just made it overcomplicated and we can just ask for the lines of a string. Doesn't look like it, it looks bad, doesn't it? Um, oh, uh, maybe it's happy. There's just so many errors. Okay, here we are. Yeah, okay, so it's expecting a lines of string, but it found a lines of... Oh, no, no. Yeah, it's not an IO lines, it's an strut lines. Okay, so that's just... Um, it's very interesting, this. So there's this thing called strut lines, which is totally different from IO lines. And we don't need buff reader or buff read, I don't think. Um, yeah, so we're holding on to a lines of string by calling lines. Hopefully, hopefully that owns the string and we're going to be okay. What's it saying? Um, it wants a lifetime. Yeah, this is really problematic. It's not owning the string. Um, I mean, we can do this a really evil way. Let's do it a really evil way and then think about whether we can do it better. So we can hold on to the whole string that we've been given, like so. We'll just call it stood in. And then we can also hold on to how many lines have we, have we so far read. Stood in lines red, which will be a use size, like just a number, and stood in lines red should be start off as zero, and then whenever we're asked for some lines, we can just say self.lines, um, so it's, sorry, self.studin.lines, so give me all the lines in this string, and then skip some, which I think is... Uh, hang on, how do you skip things? So an iter this implements iterator. Uh, iterator. Well, it implements into iterator. Does it not implement iterator? It already is an iterator, yeah. 
It is an iterator. Here we are. Yeah, sorry, I was just looking at the wrong place. So it's an iterator. And the thing that iterator can do is skip forward. Um, I guess skip. Yeah. Skip the first N. Is this evil or is this actually good? Self dot stood in dot lines dot stood in lines dot next like that. So what this is saying is turn the entire string into an iterator over lines, skip past the, the first n lines, and then give me the next thing. And this will be our answer we're going to return, but we also need to just add one um, to uh, how many lines we've read, so that next time we get back the next line. So it's a bit funny that we're um, kind of iterating over the whole string every time someone asks us for one line of the string. Um, but it, it bypasses our nasty ownership problems. The thing, the problem we were having here was that we need to own the string and also then we wanted to own an iterator over that string so that it like moves forward every time. But that would mean we had a self-referential data structure here. We'd have uh, a string and then an iterator that points at that string. Um, and that, that is very painful. Uh, how am I going to spell this? So better to just um, not do that and just keep a, a list of like how far we've got so far. This should be stood in lines red. Stood in lines red. So that's that's like, you know, you might not like that at all. This is why uh, getting around one of the problems one of the hard bits of writing Rust code is that like uh, holding on to something that you own and something that refers to that thing is basically either really difficult or actually not allowed at all, depending how you look at it. We could do this with unsafe or something. Um, we might be able to do it with pin, although I have no idea how you would do that. So better to just use basically an index to remember how far we've got. Um, and then the compiler is on our side. And we can get back to... Um, um, now we don't need this lines thing. We do call the lines method, but we don't need that um, the type that it returns to be imported because we're not using it. We're just immediately doing more stuff. Um, ah, and this is an option of str. So we need to just turn it into a string before we return it. So um, we can all we can continue on this line. So at the moment we've got an option of ampersand str, so we can just do a map on this of um, um, I guess this is going to be to string. So we can just say, well, I'm not sure how to express it in in the cool way. So let's just do it in the Dumb way, and then we could call Clippy, and we can ask Clippy whether we can make this better if we want to later. Uh, no, this should be two string, I think, because it's an ampersand str. Um, yeah, so map on an option. So ret is an option of str, of ampersand str, and map means um, if you've got something inside you, run this function over it and return an option of um, the answer that you get out. So there we go. Um, now, uh, it, okay, so it's complaining about the next thing, which is um, that the fake environment doesn't yet return a quiz JSON. So let's just put a to do in here for now and in these other ones. And let's put a to do in here as well. Gosh, it took a lot of effort to make this fake environment, didn't it? Okay, what's it moaning about? Okay, um, right stood outline doesn't use this yet, and right quiz JSON doesn't use that. So, we're well, quite in our errors, our warnings, and look at. Um, okay, so stood out is not returning the right thing. So, we this stood out method should return a 
that's that's so should we say a str or a string? It's probably just fine to just return a, a, a reference to a str. Um, and then we're going to need to implement stood out very soon, right? Um, all right, what else? We're almost back to a kind of sane world. So there's no quiz file method, so let's quickly write that. Quiz file. Again, I think, whoops, I think this is going to return a reference to a str, but we'll just to do it. As I said before, um, this to do returns never type, which means it is that counts as an ampersand str because it counts as anything because it, you never you never have to really check its type because it's never going to return. It's just going to crash there. Okay, now in main we're not making environment mutable. Are we dealt with this? We haven't quite dealt with. So why was this okay? This was okay because this the ownership of this is static. So the other option for our pain that we've just done with the stood in and the lines and all that is we could take in an ampersand str that has static ownership and then we could just hold on to an iterator over it. Um, because th then there's no worries about who owns the string because it's just it's static, which means it's like constantly owned. Um, that's something to think about. Let's add a little to do. To do. To do. Alternatively, hold a static str and an iterator over it. And that would be marginally more efficient because we wouldn't have to do this skip thing where we skip past all the lines we've already read. Um, but it would be a little bit weird because now a fake environment can only be made with a static um, string. Or I guess we could. We could make a fake environment, yeah, so we could make our lives more difficult by having a lifetime parameter here. And then this would be tick a string. Maybe that's okay. We should think about that because I feel a bit uncomfortable with having worked around this in the evil way. And actually what we're saying is someone else owns the, the string. We're just iterating over it and that's okay, maybe. So yeah, we'll see. All right, back to the topic in hand. We did make a quiz file. Um, we did make this mutable, I think. Um, so I think we're done. No, we didn't make it mutable. Where were we? Main. We got distracted. Oh no, we did for one, but not the other. Right, so what's next? Test failures. So it compiled. Okay, so we're getting somewhere. Some test failures from these to-dos that we put in. Um, they all fake. They all failed at line thirty-eight of fake environment, which was. So, by the way, can you see how, because we've done test-driven development and we're sure that our tests cover all of our functionality, we can be quite casual about, um, except this one place, real environment, where we actually have to make sure we've written correct code because no one's checking for us. But everywhere else, we can just say, "Oh, I'll put a to-do in there, and then I'll I'll do it later." And I know that my tests will keep me uh, accountable. And I'll never think I'm done when I'm not. All right, so we have to think about stood out. So stood out, I think, is just going to be a vec of u8, which we turn into a string when we need to. Um, and that means we have to create it here, like this. Um, and then when people ask us for it, we're going to, hmm, it turns an ampersand str. Maybe it should return a string because we're going to convert this vec of u8 into a string like this. And then who owns it? Oh, that's wrong, isn't it? Um, self.stood out. 
or maybe lucky this would be like a reference to self dot stood out. So now we've made a string. Like we need some kind of expect here to say. Um, actually, this this could really happen. So maybe this is an opportunity for us to return a result and do proper error handling. Yeah, why not? Why not? So this should be an anyhow result of string. So I think this will already compile. Like from UTF-8 is going to return a result. Um, basically, if if the the bytes that we've stored in this vector of U8s um, don't represent a valid UTF-8 string, then we're going to return. This should be capital R. Then we're going to return an error saying um, fail to convert a string into uh, fail to create a UTF-8 string from those bytes you gave me, and that's something that might happen if we um, if we somehow write non UTF-8 to standard out when we ask for standard out as a string, it's going to be an error. So um, in order to do this, we really need a test for it. So let's write a test before we go any further. Um, of what happens if I try and write non UTF eight? No, because this is just test. This 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 fake environment is just test code, so I don't feel like we should be testing it. Um, unless in our real environment, uh, what would happen in our real environment if we write non UTF eight to standard output? It will just work um, because. Like the it in real in the real world it doesn't know whether you're in a UTF-8 world or somewhere else, so it just lets you write any bytes you like. Um, do we want to like catch that error and? Um, I tell you what, this is never going to happen because write stood outline takes a string, so all the bytes that we actually store in our vec are going to be. So okay, we don't want this to be yeah, we, we don't need this to be a vec of U8. This can actually be a string. Um because and then that just makes our life a lot easier. So in the real environment, writing to standard out is going to write to a real uh writer, which can take bytes. But in our fake world, we're constraining ourselves to only ever write strings to standard out, which I think is Totally fine, um, yeah. By you know, because this takes in a string, this should take in a reference to a string, surely. Yeah. All right, we're going to have to fix a load of code because I changed my mind on that. So let's do it later. Um, yeah, because we're passing in a string, um, we constrain that it will always be UTF-8. So we can just return a reference to self dot stood out. So the uh, result from here is going to be an ampersand str. Uh, and now we need to like actually update this string when people call right to the outline. They're going to pass us in a string, which we're going to change in a minute. And we're just going to say um, self dot stood out uh, dot. I think um, is it append. Maybe that. Let's see what the compiler says. No, it's not. Let's look at how, what methods there are on string. Strings are like mutable strings, so that's like allowed. I think it might be push or something. Oh, push adds a ch, a, a char, and push str adds um, lots of characters um, like this. I don't think I need the star. I don't know why I thought I needed the star. And obviously that doesn't need a vec new, it needs a string new. Let me create one of these things. And now some stuff's gone wrong because we didn't add new lines. Yeah, there's no new lines here. Because actually, um, when we write a line, we also require a new line. So that should be push this character. We need some semicolons, surely. There we go. Okay, things are looking pretty good. 
um, but something is not yet implemented, which is a quiz file. So this is our like new world. So I think we got to the point where we've refactored um, our code to pretty much match our old code, and it's time for us to take a break. Okay, we're back, and we have got a failing test about saving our answers into the, the JSON file. Um, so uh, the test that's failing is one where we create two questions uh, and answers, and then we say what should be in the quiz file, and this is what should be in the quiz file. And actually, there's nothing in the quiz file because in the fake environment, we haven't yet implemented any thing that actually lets you store stuff in the quiz file. Um, which means that we need this like write quiz JSON to be implemented and the thing that returns it again. Uh, but also the real environment needs to be able to do stuff. And it's because this isn't tested, we should probably like implement this first, right? So um, what we're going to do is create a file, which I think we better look up, haven't we? Um, there's a thing called file. Yeah. So, okay, file create. That's the kind of thing we're looking for, isn't it? So let me just check the semantics of, yeah. So basically what we're doing, what we're expecting is that when we get, when we call write quiz JSON, we're basically being given the entire contents of um, the file and we want to just write it. So it's exactly this type of thing that we've got in this example. So we can do something like this. And um, ah, now this is a situation where we definitely should be handling uh, f writing errors and things. So um, we should be returning a result here. I think just a um, anyhow result with whoops, not an Andy how. Um, and if it all went well, we'd return nothing. Um, and the file name is quiz.json. So there is going to be a bit of um, file handling. And we're just going to save everything out and then say OK. And the question mark here is where we do our error handling. These two question marks are going to return an error if there's some kind of problem. So that's not too much untested code. Don't feel too bad about that. In the real world, I'd probably write some kind of um, system level test that checks that this really works. And while we're here, let's do the read quiz JSON as well. So um, this is it, their example of um, how to read. So I think we can just copy. Like this, don't need this assertion. I'm going to return a string. Well, I guess it's going to return a result of string, isn't it? So we need to change these interfaces to match this chicken that I'm making. So let's have a look at the environment. Uh, reading is going to return a result of string, and writing is going to return a result of unit which means that our fake environment also needs to have those signatures. Um, we might need later need to tell the fake environment um, to be able to tell it, I want you to give me an error, please, when, you, when I call you. So let's think about what the test would look like for that, just so we... So let's have a, a, a test that we're going to write. Um, failing to write to JSON file uh, prints an error, something like that. And then also, I guess, failing to read prints an error. So that's the, we're going to have to deal with those in a second. Let's get this test working, since this is the one we wrote. So our fake environment is going to, um, when we write a test, a quick write a JSON, which is all we need for now, we're basically just going to save this information we've been given. 
Um, so I guess we're just going to call this saved JSON. Uh, I guess it starts off being none. Um, so it's going to be an option. So we better wrap it up in an option. So we're going to need this property inside us. What did I call it? Saved JSON option of string. Uh, it's going to start off being none. And when we're asked for it, we're going to return it. So it's going to be. We're going to crash if. Um, no JSON was saved. Um, just a reference to the string inside save JSON that we unwrap because uh, we there should be stuff in there when we ask for it. Oh, hold on! I've done the wrong type of result here. In a in a number of places, it should be an anyhow result. In lots of places. Anyhow, results like so, and also in the fake environment. What else have we got? Um, did I not save? Oh no, yeah, I didn't use the correct file name. That was um, bad, wasn't it? Um, but yeah, we need to import uh, studio file. Like so. What else? Oh no, std, std fs file. I mean, it told me on the in the compiler right? should be enough for me. Uh, okay, that we're not writing the right type of thing. So, write all expects to take a um, a slice of u eight. So, I think we can just say as bytes, maybe two bytes. We need to bring in studio read to be able to use that read to string method on a file, which we used here. Yeah. Okay. What next? Um, returning a reference to a temporary value. So I guess the best thing to do here is change this method to just return a string. So this is. This is the um, quiz file. We're returning a reference to a str. Um, we could we could hack this around a bit, but I think actually the best thing to do is to return a string. Um, no, no, like this. So still unwrap it and then clone the string inside. Yeah, I think that's the thing to do. Um, yeah, no, not that. What we should do is, I guess, we should do cloned. So instead of instead of getting the string out, taking ownership of it, and then cloning it and returning it, which is what we were doing, is wrong. What we should do is um, uh, replace the option with an uh, um, another option that we own. Which contains a cloned string, and then unwrap that. Oh no, we can't do cloned on a. Uh, what should we do? Let's do asref. Dot cloned. So what this means is, um, save JSON is an option of string, 
change it into an option of reference to string, unwrap it, and then clone that reference. I think that will work. No, it should be cloned, and not cloned. Okay, it seemed happy with our code, but it's all failing. Failing because these two are supposed to fail because we haven't implemented them yet. This one panics because there is no saved JSON because we haven't actually implemented the code that makes this test pass. So um, we've got a to-do written in our code, which is our, every time we get given an answer, we should save um, the, the JSON file. And actually, what I've decided to do is save the JSON file every every time round the loop, so that if we kind of crash or get broken in the middle, we've actually already saved the JSON. So basically, we're going to do something like um, env dot right. Is it right? Quiz JSON with something here. Get rid of the count because. Instead of counting how many we've been given, we're actually going to keep some kind of um, questions JSON. Well, it's not going to be JSON yet. It's going to be some kind of VEC, I guess, of questions. And every time around the loop, we're going to make a question which is going to be some kind of class we haven't made yet. And now we've got hold of this question thing. Oh, no, it's have got the same name. That's bad. Let's call this question def. No, let's call this um, question text. Uh, and then our question object is going to have some kind of thing that we can put in here. Uh, now this is probably some kind of bytes or something, isn't it? So, oh no, we, we got this to return a string. So we've already dealt with the bytes question. So now, um, if we're, yep, we, so we read in the question text and store it inside our question and then correct answer. Should look like this. And then once we've read in all those things, then question dot um, incorrect answers equals incorrect answers. And then we're going to save some kind of sturdy JSON. Uh, what should we do? Should we make it just take it? Should write quiz JSON actually take in a question object? Why not? So let's change the interface of our um, thing to take in a question. So this should be, oh no, 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 I've done this wrong, I've done this wrong. Um, once we've finished, we've finished creating the question, we should add it to questions. And we should pass questions into the quiz JSON and it should deal with the kind of parsing and stuff. And I guess this is going to return a result, so we need to put a question mark here that handles errors, which means this returns a result. Um, is that right? Um, and anyhow, result. I guess this is fine because we'll handle this error in the code that calls this and print out some kind of... Well, no, I think actually I kind of want to handle the, the error inside the add function, I think. Um, this this function is getting a bit long, but um, if this result was an error, then we're going to do something and then return, which we'll do in a second. So we've written a lot of imaginary code, so let's try and um, unimaginary it. So first of all, write quiz JSON takes in a vec of questions now. So let's make it do that. Um, we haven't got a question class yet, so this is not gonna Ah oh, but that means no I don't like that. No 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 okay. Change my mind. Change my mind. 
We're going to keep the this um, interface really simple. Um, so instead of that, let's allow. Um, but the reason we're keeping it simple is it's not tested. So let's just do let's call two JSON on questions, and then we can write a two JSON function for questions that we can. Um, Test. Now we've got two possible errors here. So this thing. Let's do this a different way. Let's let's call out to a little function here. Um, save questions, which can go wrong in two different ways. That's my point. So I want to just catch this thing here. Pass in the questions. I guess pass in a reference to the questions. Um, uh, this can just be a free function called save questions. It's going to return a result. Anyhow, result. It's going to take in a reference to a vec of questions. I guess it could be a reference to a slice of questions. And it's going to do two things. It's going to turn it into JSON, which is going to look something like this. Um, to string of, oh, this should be, I knew that looked wrong, questions, colon. So it's going to turn the questions into a string which might go wrong. And then it's going to save. Oh, we need to pass in the environment as well. Then it's going to tell the environment to save the, this JSON. Does that take in a string? And that's also potentially going wrong. And then we, if all goes well, we just return the result of unit. I think that's what that's going to look like. And the point of separating this out into a function, apart from the fact that the other thing was getting long, is that um, there's two possible things that might go wrong here. We want to just wrap them up into one result that then um, we deal with here. So if saving it went wrong, do something. OK, how does this look? How close are we to having? Um, all right, this should be, n should be some kind of reference to an environment. Uh, unreachable statement we're okay with. We didn't provide the environment when we called save questions. We need to pass in immutable. No, we don't. No, we don't. Um, how about that? What next? Okay, there's no question um, type yet. We haven't created one, and also count is wrong. So we can fix that. The count should be the number of questions, which is pretty straightforward. Put a comma in there. Okay, so we've got to make a questions. We're long overdue for making a question uh, class struct struct. Struct question. And we should maybe there are some tests for this that we need, or maybe it's really done. So it's a public struct. It has public things like Question text? No, just uh, text, wasn't it? And um, correct answer, which is also a string. And then incorrect answers, which is a vec of string, I think. Um, and it's going to be serializable.
and deserializable. And we should probably also make it um, debug and maybe some other stuff. Let's see. So we haven't included this thing, so let's include it. Question. And now it should compile and we'll see all the problems with it. Um, yeah, we should definitely bring in 30 serialize and deserialize. At least it's compiling, eh? That's good. Like that. What else? Yeah, people should be importing it where they use it, which I think at the moment is just the add code. Unreachable statement still okay. What else? Um, oh well, I've just got some kind of typo, which is why it's complaining about something it shouldn't be. Yeah, that should be pub, not put. Now, some of this, these errors will go away, I think. Yeah, there's no new function yet, so let's make one. Now, arguably, we should... I'm not sure I'm liking this, um, like create an empty question and fill it in as we go thing, because... Yeah, let's not do that. Let's not... I don't know why I did it that way. I don't like having a partially constructed object, so let's not make a question here. Let's just get hold of all the information we need to make a question and make the question here. So, in fact, we can just push it straight into our um, thing like this. So, it's text is question text. In fact, now we can just call this variable text. Text, correct answer. Incorrect answers all just get put in, so we don't need to put them into anything. This can just be called text, which kind of tidies up that discrepancy. Um, and now we don't need a, a new function on question because we're just using the construction default construction syntax um, and. We're getting close to um, our test is failing now for a better reason. These two we're expecting to fail. This one is failing. Uh, we got some warnings and errors. So first of all, there's a to do which we will leave for now. This is also to do with that problem. So we'll leave all of that because that's to do with our other two failing tests that we're not doing yet. So only one failure we're interested in for the moment, which is that. We're expecting it to look like JSON, and for some reason, it doesn't look like JSON. It looks like the debug print of um, our object, which is interesting. So let's have a look at what we're doing here. So we're calling save questions. Inside side save questions, we're turning this vec into a string. Yeah. We're saying turn it into a JSON string and then save it into um, the environment and the environment's then providing it back again as a string. So we're just saving the string we were given and then giving it back later. So for some reason this is not serializing in a kind of JSON format we were expecting but it's looking like a kind of debug what if we just turn off debug so that we can find out what's going on here? I feel like I'm doing something really stupid. Oh, could it be? Oh, no, no, no. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. Okay, so let's have a look at our assertion. 
and we'll realize our problem, I think. Yeah. So, in our assertion, we're saying I want quiz file to look like some JSON, um, but quiz file is a string, and this is a JSON value. So actually, what we want is is the quiz file to look the same as if we'd turn this into a string. So I think if we just do thirty JSON to string reference to that stuff. Um, and then unwrap any errors. Failed to serialize. Expected answer. Just to be clear, this shouldn't happen, right? Now, this is getting close now. So the left hand side is just an, uh, an array, and the right hand side says questions colon, and then an array. And it uses the word question, whereas we're using the word text. So let's change that, because I think I preferred my naming uh, the first time I did this. So even though it's weird to have something called question inside a question, I think it's, it's right in this case. So where do we do that? In here. Now we've got rid of that question object. It's quite easy for us to call this question. So this was a good change, generally. Um, so that was renaming it to question, but also it needs to be wrapped up in a, a vector. So I guess we want another object. Instead of it just being a vec, we want to make a class, a struct called questions. We could do it differently, but this is the most straightforward way of doing it, I think. Struct questions, which contains the questions which are a vec of question. And this is going to be serializable and stuff. Debug. Deserialize. Serialize. Use serialize. Serialize. Deserialize. And it's going to need um, a, some kind of push. And I guess we can just make questions public, right? So then we can make, instead of questions being a vec here, it's a questions object. Which, by the way, we need to, we need to make it even exist here. There we go. Uh, now this is a questions object. I guess we want a, I guess we want, let's just provide a default. There and then when we push things, it's going to be questions dot questions dot push because it's got a vec inside it, which is a bit weird. Maybe we could provide a push method on questions to make this look a bit nicer. So to make that default thing work, we're going to need to say, oh, in fact, no, not this wrong place. Um, we can just derive default, I think, and it will just might do the sensible thing, which is an empty vec. I think that's going to work. See what it says. We haven't imported questions. What else? Unreachable statement. Oh, I spelled use wrong. There's no end to the number of things I can spell wrong. Um, Hmm, what's going on here? Ah, oh, missing semicolon. Nothing, nothing difficult. Wish my editor was telling me stuff. Okay, so, oh, <laughs> that's not how you type that. You have to say derive these things. Okay. Uh, questions needs to be public so I can use it. Uh, questions doesn't have a len method because questions dot questions does so again making it maybe we should have provided a len method and save questions should take in a questions 
we want this to do what it's supposed to do. And we need to bring in question into the questions module. So it knows how to deal with that. Whoops, that's not how you do that. Like so. Separate groups, I think. All right, we're pretty close now. So questions, questions. Now they're in a different order. So maybe the thing to do is parse it as JSON and can compare the two things um, as JSON values instead of as strings. This is a bit of a gotcha, right? We, we're comparing two strings. The string got by turning this into a string and the string that we saved. So they both come out of said JSON to string, um, but they may have different ordering. There's no kind of guarantees on what order things happen in. Um, I mean, the two questions should be in the right order, but there's stuff inside question, correct answer, incorrect answers that could be in any ordering. So let's parse this. Um, from str reference to that string we've been given. We can get rid of this expect, but actually we're going to need a very similar thing here. So this should be failed to deserialize. Answer, right? I guess it failed to deserialize quiz file. Something like that. Right, what have I done wrong? Oh, we need to tell it what type of thing it is. So I guess we can just, we just want a, a, a adjacent value, I think, because that's the, the return type of this JSON thing is just a value, JSON value, I think. Let's check. Okay, so our test passed. So it looks like we're doing things right. So let's just double check what we've done here. So we, we made some, we used the JSON macro to make a adjacent value object. And then we compared it against another value object that we got by parsing the string that we'd saved into our quiz file. Any errors here will get surfaced. So I think this test is fairly valid. So now we've got a couple of failing tests because we want, wanted to make sure we didn't forget to handle read and write errors. So we're going to need to make our fake environment able to give us errors that we can then deal with. So let's copy some of this and we've already got, just copy this bit. So failing to write to JSON is the first thing we're going to do. So we call add and we expect something to get added to standard output. Um, env dot stood out or something. What does the envir fake environment give us? Gives us, yeah, just a method called stood out. And it should be um, failed to write to um, quiz.json, I guess. And maybe also, uh, so we're going to like throw some kind of error that says something like fake write error or something. Um, so that means that our environment should. So let's just make, given that we've got a mutable environment already, let's just make a nasty method to say um, um, error on write equals true, something like that. And we'll make a property on our fake environment, which allows us to create a write error. So let's just error on write. Just make a public property, which just says, should we fail when we try and write? Oh, that was the other so note about something else. Um, and so error on write should be false when we create it. Uh, now our test should fail. I meant bool, not boolean. 
think I might have been writing TypeScript. Okay, so now uh, that everything compiles and still fails because we're not using that error on write thing. Um, oh, by the way, this is showing us that actually it's going to, the standard out is going to have some more stuff in it, not just this thing that we're expecting. Um, so when we save, I guess it's when we error on write. I guess, it's okay. All right. So it, it means error on, on writing to quiz JSON. So if self dot error on write, then some kind of error. Otherwise, do what we used to do. I like my functions to be one logical line of code, so I could have done an early return here, but since this is short, it felt fine to have that in the else side. So let's just make a string error of something along the lines of, what did I say it was going to be? Fake write error. Fake write error. Now, will this... Um, okay, so I need to make some kind of anyhow, I mean, what if I just into this? I need some kind of uh, anyhow error. I think there's stuff in, let's have a look at how anyhow works. I think there's a way of just saying to anyhow, just give me some kind of error, please. Maybe it's under functions. Yeah, construct an ad hoc error from a string. So I think it's just anyhow, colon, colon, anyhow. Something like that. What does it say? Oh, it's a macro. Okay. Now we're panicking because on line 42, we haven't actually, so I think it's because our real code hasn't handled the error yet. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So let's do it. So stood out, uh, env dot right stood out line. Um, format something with the other the error message in it um, and what did I I wrote it in test what I wanted the an the answer to be so let's copy it failed to write to quiz.json colon and then the error so I think it's okay to copy from the test here when I'm just copying error messages I tend to feel okay but generally I avoid copying things from the test to the um, real code or vice versa because um, it's kind of cheating, so I'm not really checking that I'm doing. Um, like the, one of the advantages of writing tests is that you end up writing the code twice, so you've got two chances to get it right or get it wrong. All right, so there's a load of other stuff beforehand, so I think this is correct. So our assertion should say one, that there's a new line at the end. And two, that there's a load of stuff beforehand. This is a mess, isn't it? Let's make this easier to read. Like this. So that our error message should look, well, our standard out should look like Oh gosh, it should really be written to standard error there, shouldn't it? Uh, that would be better. Okay, so let's just put in a to do. To do, this should, the error should really be written to std error. But we're just putting everything out to standard out. And we're not returning an error result from our executable either. Um, so it's another thing we should really do, but we are handling errors, which was the, the, what the question said, maybe not in exactly the right way. 
Okay, so these these things got asked because we didn't fail until after we'd actually entered the question and tried to save to quiz.json. When we save to quiz.json, we get a fake write error, which we print to the console and stop. Um, and that's a fair enough test, I think. So let's now try um, dealing with errors when we try and read the JSON file. Now, this, we're not actually going to read the JSON file at all if we're... Oh, we are, we are. Okay, so uh, there's another situation here that we haven't talked about, which is that if I'm adding new questions, I don't want to delete all the old questions. So the first thing I do when I'm adding new questions is read in the file containing the old questions. So how are we going to um, simulate this situation? We need to we need to do another add, which is add. I guess we can say multiple adds. Um, save all the questions. Multiple adds save all the questions. So basically we're going to call add twice. Um, using the same environment. Well, how are we going to do this? Yeah. It's like we're running the program twice. No, I think the best thing to do is set up an environment which has um, a, a fake JSON file already in there. An existing JSON. Uh, let's just say and um, JSON file. So it's still going to take the same uh, standard input, but it's also going to do some kind of um, it's also going to have something stored um, in its JSON file, which is going to look like some of the JSON we had before. Where is it down here? We'll just make sure that there's one question already in there. Like so. So it's already got the question about 6 times 9. Then we're going to ask it what's 6 times 8. And at the end, the what we're asserting is that the final JSON has both questions in, I guess. So I guess rather than being the exact, like we've already tested the details of what you save in the file. I could just check the length of questions. So I think in reality what I would do here is I would test the full JSON. Um, all right. So if I'm going to test the full JSON, why don't I just test the full JSON? Fine. So it's going to be an assertion very much like this one. I was going to say we'll just check the length here for um, brevity to make this test a bit easier to read. But if I'm telling you what I would do, why don't I just do what I would do? So I think what we're expecting is the question we started off with, plus this new question we just created, just to be sure we're not really um, um, actually somehow messing this up completely, let's just change something here. Like so. So now we know it's the thing we typed in here that's getting reflected in that output file, not some kind of weird crossover with another test or something strange. So we need this environment to have a method called this, this fake environment. Um, so with stood in, it's going to have another little partner called with stood in a JSON file. So this should be stood in, and this should be JSON file. Is that a str? What is it? What is it going to be? I think it's going to be a string. Let's just let allow us to pass in a string. So like slightly odd interface here. Takes in one strut and one string, but that's like it's all test code. It's tailored exactly to what we're testing. Um, and actually with stood in is now going to call that. And it's going to just no, it's not. It's not going to call it. They're going to have. They're going to be two of them because this has an, a none. 
and this is going to have a summon here. So, JSON file. Okay, this was easier than I expected. All right, I think maybe we can run that test and find out all the things I did wrong. It's expected a string, but it got a result. Oh, we haven't unwrapped that. Um, so when we create this JSON string, um, failed to um, serialize. Serialize with an S or a Z, who knows? Um, Z to be consistent with the code, S to be consistent with my culture. Fail to serialize um, existing JSON, something like that. Just enough that we can find this line. What else is it moaning about? Oh yeah, text is not what that is called. So in our fake environment, we called this stood in. Which is consistent there with that, so that's probably good. And we need a ampersand somewhere. If we're calling serdy JSON two string, we pass it a reference to our JSON value that we're serializing. And this one's failing because we haven't implemented yet, and this one fails because we've only got the second answer because we're not... Okay, so they're both failing because we haven't actually implemented the functionality we're testing, which is good. So the test the functionality we're testing is that before we start adding questions on, we should first read in the questions that are already saved. So instead of calling questions default, we should call, we should say read in quiz.json. I guess we need to deal with errors if that goes wrong as well. So it'll be, it'll be, I guess we should have read questions. Since we've got write questions, it's quite neat. Takes in the environment. And there's two different possibilities here. If the file doesn't exist, that's one type of error. And if if it, if we fail to read it, it's a different type of error. So we should ideally separate out those two things and, and do different things in them. So read questions. Takes in just an environment. I'm going to take an immutable pointer to an environment because, well, let's try not. Let's try taking in just a. Well, I think it's gonna. I think this is gonna fail. We'll see. Anyway, it's gonna return a questions object. It's gonna return a result of questions. An anyhow result. And similar to when we did write questions, we're gonna to need to deal with that. So it's gonna look something like this, isn't it? Um. And we could return a result from this function and kind of share the code that like takes a result and turns it into writing to standard out. But we were not doing that yet. So this should be let mute questions equal. Either the result that we got back. So it's really It's really a match on results. So we're going to match on results, and if it's OK, then just return what the thing inside, the questions we've returned. So we can get rid of this. This should be read questions. So we, so we basically ask for the questions get back a result, based on the result, it's either OK or it's an error. If it's an error, do this stuff. Otherwise, it gives us back questions, um, which we put into this variable and use as before. So this should be, yeah, fail to read quiz.json. Yeah, that all looks fine. So now we just need to make read questions work OK. And let's first of all just make it return an error. Anyhow. Well, 
like so. And some of our, many of our tests for, are failing because we are hard coding the fact that we fail to read right at the beginning of the function. So why don't we make our lives look a little bit less messy by just not doing anything, just doing what we did before. Check that our tests mostly still pass. Yeah, so now a couple of places go uh, go wrong, which are the tests we already had failing, because they actually need us to do this reading. So next step is actually read in the questions from the environment, deal with any errors, especially the two different errors of missing files or not missing files. Uh, time to take a break there, and and we're back, and we've got this test failing at the moment, which is one where we start off with some questions in our JSON file, then we enter a new question by using add, and we should have the old question and the new question uh, in our question file by the end, and it's not working because when we actually read, uh, because we're not actually reading the existing questions in before we start. Or rather, we, we, we're not, um, yeah, this is where we actually would do the reading in from the environment. So we can do something along the lines of, let's, uh, I guess, question JSON equal end dot uh, read quiz JSON, which I think comes out as a, oh, a result of string. So we can question mark that. Um, man, I guess this should be a mutable reference to the environment. Let's just see where we call this. So which means we need to, oh, we've already got a mutable reference to the environment, so that's okay. So we get hold of the question, Jason. Now we're going to parse it. Um, so this is going to be something like Sadie Jason from Stra of a reference to that question, Jason. And we maybe can just question mark that because it's a there's a potential error from Sadie Jason. Um, uh, yeah, so this, so what you would think maybe you could just say Sadie Jason from Stra because that already returns the results, but it doesn't return the right kind of result. So what we do is do the question mark to say, if you've got an error, do the conversion that automatically comes for free when you do a question mark into an anyhow result of error type. Otherwise, um, return this OK value. So I think that should work. Let's see what happens in our test now. So essentially, we read in the questions before we started, and then we added on more. Um, now, what's gone wrong? Uh, is that we're panicking at line 59 of fake environment because we haven't actually implemented reading the quiz JSON. Yeah, that would explain it. So I think it's just a matter of returning OK of self.saved JSON, which is what? It is an option of string. Um, so, I mean, I guess we should unwrap it, which will mean any test that expects us to have, um, uh, expects us to have something in the quiz JSON. Mm. Well, let's see how this goes. I think a lot of our tests are going to fail because there's nothing in the quiz JSON when we read it. So maybe it should, yeah, it should return an error when, okay. So let's let's do that. So what's the best thing to do? We could match on self.savejson, or rather reference to self.savejson. Just going to make that error we're seeing there go away as well. And then if we've got something, then it's just a matter of like converting this into the right kind of thing, which will be an OK um, of the result of cloning JSON, because JSON is a reference to string, yep. And if it's none, then we can just return an error. And I guess it's going to be an anyhow 
anyhow. Um, no. And maybe we need to fake like a file not found. But anyway, for now, let's just say no JSON file. Yeah, we probably need to fake an IO error of, of types, which means this result might type might need to change so that we can actually identify that. Um, that type. We'll get there. Okay, so how does this do? Does it pass our test, our new test? Um, I think our new test did pass, did it? Because a lot of the other questions failed. Um, multiple ads save all the questions. Yeah, so the only test that passes is our new test. We've broken all the others because they all hit this line, which is definitely not right. So I think what we want to do is distinguish different situations when we try and read in the quiz JSON. Because if we think about what our code needs to be, it's going to be something like, if when you read it in, there was no file, just return an empty questions. Uh, but if there was a, some kind of read error reading it in, return an error. So I think we want to do some kind of... Um, yeah, there's three conditions then. There's, I read it in and it's fine, it doesn't exist, or um, there was some kind of error. So I think like the best thing for us to do is, well, no, there's two things we could do. We could either return a result, or we could return a result of an option. Um, sorry, we could either return our own enum, or we could return a result of an option, and the meaning of an okay none would be that there's no file there, which would be convenient for our fake, because our fake can already can do that quite easily. Um, but is it a nice way of expressing this? It's not as explicit, but I think it's okay. So let's just document this function to say it returns a result of option of string. Uh, returns Returns, okay, none, if file does not exist. Okay, sum. If the file exists and could be read and error otherwise. Something like that. Okay, so in our fake environment, that's going to be quite simple to implement. It's just going to be um, self dot save JSON dot map uh, It's going to be okay because we're never going to get a read error dot cloned Is cloned a method on an option? No, um, so we need map s dot. Uh, I think two string is probably the right answer, and this should return an option of string. And then in the real environment, it's also going to return an option of string. And this is the untested code, so we have to be extra careful. But if opening the file fails, it might fail with um, with some file not found. So we need to check for that explicitly. So we'll take out the question mark, so we've got an open result. And we're going to match on the open result. And it's either going to be... So I guess this is let file equal... It's either going to be OK uh, and just give us back a, a file, in which case we'll return it, 
or it's going to be an error of some kind of I.O. error type. Um, which I think is this. I think that's an enum. Slightly out of my depth here. What does file open return? Sends an IO colon colon result of file. So that does mean it is it is going to be an IO error. So let's see what that might be. So that is just a struct. I was expecting an enum. Maybe there's a type or something on it. Um, oh, an error kind, yeah. Somehow we need to find an error kind in here. But we don't have one here. So, yeah, let's just do a bit of searching. Rust find IO error type. Here we go. That's exactly my question. The answer is you have to do e dot kind. Okay. Let's try that. So match e dot kind. Now how this works, I don't know. I don't understand how you call. It. You can call that kind method. Um, but yeah, so most of these errors are going to be real errors, but not found is going to be special. So if it's not found, we're going to return an OK none. And otherwise, we're just going to return. Can we do that? No, we want to do e dot into. We want to do error of e dot into. I think oh, they should be returned. This both of these should be returned. That's why it's confused. So we want to skip return early in both these cases. And we need a semicolon here. And uh, now file is of type file, which is right. Um, but, oh yeah, we need to, um, we changed the return type, so we need to. And this file should still be mutable. Now, do are we happy with how we've written this code? If it's okay, we just return the file. Otherwise, we check for the error. We could, this could be an if let instead of a match. And Clippy would tell us to do so. Um, might be better, I suppose. So equivalent, but if we can do if let. Um, not found equals e dot kind. It doesn't read that great, this. Um, but because Clippy would make us do this, I'm gonna do it anyway. Otherwise, return. And semicolon there. Right. So, um, check this code because it's not tested. So, do a file open. If it opened fine, then continue. If not, if it was a file not found error, then return OK none, meaning this file didn't exist. Um, if it... Um, uh, if there was some other error, return it. Continue to do what we did before, which is read file contents and return it as a string, which means that we've done it for envir uh, fake environment already. We've done it for real environment. So now we can do the code that uses it. So the code that uses it expects to get back a result and just uses question mark to return early. But now we've got a potential none here. So we can say if let's... Um, Question JSON equals question JSON. Then do this stuff. 
And then if it came back as a none, then we just need to return a questions default. An OK questions default, in fact. Now we could wrap the OK around this whole if, but it's going to look pretty ugly, so we'll leave it like this. All right, and we think we might have some passing tests now, I think. Nope, we've still got some compile errors. Um, uh, in the fake environment, we have not done the right thing because we save JSON is an option of string. We need to make it an option of reference to that string first, then copy that string on the way past. Yeah, I think that's right. Could we just do save JSON dot clone? Looks happy. Okay, so yeah, it was an option of string and we want to return a result of option of string. Um, so we just clone the whole option and that will clone the string inside it. And we're also getting warned about real environment line 35. Doesn't need to be mutable. Fine. And we've got a failure, which is our um, new test, which we haven't yet implemented. All the others pass. So we're looking good. Right, so let's go on to uh, the latest test we've written, which says that when we fail to read, we print an error, and we haven't actually written this test yet. So let's write it now. Um, OK, so we're going to create an environment which fails to read. Um, so it's going to look something like this. Uh, but actually, it doesn't really matter what's in stood in, because it's going to fail to read immediately. So we can just give an empty string for stood in, and then it's going to be error on read equals true, which is something we haven't done yet. Then we're going to call add, and the standard output and yes, this should again be on standard error, but we're skipping that step. Um, standard output is just going to say failed to read. Quiz.json is going to give us back some kind of fake read, read error, which we haven't done yet. So the part we haven't done is that fake environment doesn't yet have an error on read property. We're going to give it one now. So this is obviously not the only way to um, like write mocks that can fail, but this feels reasonably flexible. Like there's no reason not to have these public properties that you adjust later because this is all just a, a fake. Like I, I much prefer immutable stuff generally, but when it's just a mock or something like this, giving it just a property you can override feels fine to me. Um, now we need to just make sure when we create our object, we initialize error on read, and then when we get asked to read the file, um, here we need to check for it. If self.error on read, do one thing, otherwise do something else. And the something we're going to do is return an error, which I guess will be an anyhow um, what did I say? Fake read error. Okay. Now I've import I've imported I've accidentally imported anyhow the anyhow macro directly there. Let's just be consistent with what we've done before. That's probably fine to do that, but I just want to keep it consistent through the file. Okay, so what happens now? Um, it nearly passed already, so I must have already written this code in add. Um, let's just check what happens. Failed to read, and then here's the bug. I added the word to twice. <laughs> Failed to read quiz.json. So it passes, so we're good. We have um, uh, completed some tests around the add functionality, um, including like reading and writing to that JSON file. 
So let's check back on the question and see where we've got to. So our does our, our application does handle some some errors where you reading and writing a file and it doesn't work correctly. Um, and our, we do have some logic around the quiz questions. It's in the library part of our crate. User input and stuff is done in application code. We we haven't done much in the application part. We want to be able to unit test as much as possible, which is better to do in the library part. It's divided up into modules. So we're, we're doing fine, but we have so far only really done question entering mode, which I've called add mode. Um, I think we might be done with question entering mode. Let's check whether it works by running it, shall we? Um, let's ask it how to run it. Yeah, of course, we have to say add. Um, oh, now there appears to be a quiz.json, but it doesn't have anything in it. Let's just have a look at that. There's no, yeah, there's nothing in it. Uh, so let's delete quiz.json because our program is now capable of creating one. Um, so let's just say Q1, correct one, incorrect. Two, incorrect three, incorrect four. No to continue. Let's have a look at our quiz.json. It's got some stuff in it, so let's do one more run. Add another question. Question two, answer to one, answer to two, answer to three, answer to four. No. I think we are okay with the fact that continuing uh, does loop around again because we tried that earlier so let's have a look at quiz.json so it does look okay uh, the last check we can do is that 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 it still starts up again and it's okay uh, so it, that it fit the json it creates appears to be json it's happy with so it looks like adding questions is working so let's think about the other mode which is quiz mode so it loads in the stored questions presents them one by one and then checks the player input and presents a score at the end. So let's start with just like there it being a quiz mode. So where have we got to so far? Um, okay, there is a quiz mode and it pretends that we haven't entered any questions even though we have. Um, and so I guess the first thing that quiz mode needs to do is load in the questions, which can do something very similar what we do and add, hang on there's no tests let's write a test before we do anything else so config test if I could type that make a mod called tests and make a test which says um, I guess we could do um, if there are no questions um, print an error. So that's already, this test should already pass. So we can make an environment, make a fake environment. Um, which is empty for now. And quiz it. And then we can make some assertions about the standard output. And, and again, there should probably be a to-do here as well, saying that well, this should be errors should go to standard error. And the expected, let's just copy the expected text. There should be a new line on the end of it though, so add that and let's run those tests now did that test uh, run uh, I don't see it am I missing it add test oh yeah here we are it's mixed in with the others that's weird um, if there are no questions printed now already passed that's a bit Worrying, so let's just double check it's really running. Yep, 
it was it's failing saying that string is wrong so we're all good all right so let's have another test for one or the other so this is like a tdd thing right that like i've I've written a completely fake bit of functionality, and then I've written a test that checks that bit of fake functionality. That all seems a bit pointless until we make it do something else, and this test is still going to pass in that new circumstance, and then we know that we, we're, that we're implementing the code in a decent way. Okay, so let's say uh, read error for quiz file prints an error as well, right? Since we're dealing with errors... Um, so this is going to be similar, except we're going to tell the environment um, um, what is it? Error on read is true, and it's now going to say something like failed to read quiz JSON uh, fake read error. Something like that, with a new line. Um, all right, and that should fail. It does. So we're going to now copy the code whoops, from add, which reads stuff in. And, okay, the read questions function was defined in add, but is useful for both add and quiz. So, um, and whereas write questions won't be useful. So I guess we could just make a little module called read questions. Just for this, couldn't we? Why not? Read questions. Like, it, I'm trying to resist the temptation to call this utils. Right. That is almost always the wrong name for a module. So now add is going to need to use that module. And why are you moaning? I think because I haven't saved my lib file yet. Uh, quiz is also going to need it. Oh, it's because the, I guess our part of our problem is this doesn't compile yet because we haven't imported the stuff it needs. How's that? It's not public. And now I think the imports that we used were not actually right. It should be read questions, colon, colon, read questions, and then this will work. Yeah, it was guessing. Um, because the thing wasn't public or whatever. Right, now this won't be mutable, so that's rather nice, isn't it? Um, we don't need to modify questions. At the moment, we're not doing anything with questions. Um, but we do, in particular, we don't need to modify questions because um, uh, this is the quiz part, which doesn't modify the questions. So it's quite a nice semantic thing. Um, okay, our error message doesn't quite match what we expected because there should be quotes around this name. And our test pass. Okay, so... Um, next test, I guess, is actually asking questions. Um, so, yeah, we're going to need to provide some questions. Um, so let's, let's imagine there's one question for now. And uh, what's it going to do? It's going to tell us... Reads and verifies the player input and presents the score. So I guess we'll tell the player as soon as they've answered the question whether they got it right or wrong. So let's say wrong answer is um, fed back. Reported, let's say reported. Wrong answer is reported. 
So we're going to make an environment which this time doesn't have any kind of failure, and um, but it's going to need some stuff instead in because we're going to answer the question incorrectly. So we're going to provide some kind of stuff here, but we don't know what that is yet. Um, and actually, it's going to hang on. We're going to use with std in a JSON file. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. So std in is going to be a string, and the JSON file is going to be some kind of use of the JSON macro. I think what is with std in a JSON file? It takes in a string, so we need to turn that into a string in a second. So we're going to bring in the JSON macro and then we're going to write some JSON in here and it's going to be questions and then an array of questions and the first question is going to be oh, what does this look like? We've got this in, in add let's just copy something that looks about right from there we'll copy one which just has one question in it so far in fact, we need this whole thing, right? We're going to turn it into a string as well. So that's going to be useful for us. Too many brackets, maybe? No. Why is it complaining? Oh, well, because we haven't unwrapped it or something like that. What do we do here? Oh, we, I missed the expect line. We wanted to just copy more. Um, like this, get rid of that comma. There we go. So far the environment doesn't need to be mutable. But when we call quiz, it will need to be mutable. All right, so it's asking us, what is six times nine? And it's the, the program is gonna offer us four options and presumably those options are going to be in some kind of random order. Um, but testing that is going to be annoying. So I guess we could do we could we could make our environment have like a, a fake shuffler which doesn't actually shuffle the answers uh, but that wouldn't actually test everything or we could do a fake shuffler that like always shuffles them in a predictable way even that wouldn't wouldn't be too good i think what i want to do given we've been doing this question for a long time is always present the questions in a fixed order and um, leave it as an exercise for the reader to make them be in a random order and also check that you the answer you expect is um, is the right answer even though they've been shuffled so yeah well i think we'll leave that as an exercise for you so the standard input we're going to provide is just um is this going to say a b c or d i guess it is so we're going to just say a new line and that, I think that's all we need to say. Just quiz me. It asks us the first question. We say A. Oh, that's correct. We want to say B then. We say B. And we expect the program to tell us we, we got it wrong. So it's going to be something like... Um, it's going to say a whole load of stuff to us, isn't it? Um, let's lay this out a bit more nicely. It's going to say, question one. What is six times nine? A. Six times. A. 42, B, banana, C, apple, D, strawberry. And then, then we need to say something like, your answer 
A, B, C, or D, something like that. And it's going to have new lines at the end of each line. Like so. And in fact, it's not going to have a new line here. Okay. And then it's going to say, no, it is going to have a new line here because we then need to say incorrect. The correct answer was A. Um, and then it's going to say total score zero out of one. All right, so it's not the most fancy thing ever, but it looks all right, doesn't it? Something like that. So this test is going to fail. It doesn't do any of this stuff. It pretends that you haven't entered any questions, even though you have. So uh, let's make this pass without doing too much work. So we don't need to loop yet. So first of all, check whether there are any questions. So if uh, this should now be called questions. If questions is empty. Uh, hold on. What is it? Uh, if questions dot questions is empty, there we go. Then we're going to do this and then return, and that will keep our previous test passing. But now, if questions is not empty, let's not, let's not abbreviate for question in questions dot questions. Um. Oh well, look, we're accidentally looping. I mean, I guess it's so it's so obvious that we should loop here that maybe the right thing to do is write another test that checks that it'll ask us two questions. Or just expand this test. Why not expand this test? It, uh, normally I'm against like having a, a test that checks multiple things at the same time, but like we just saw, it's so hard for me to... Um, to write the code without just fully implementing it. I may as well do that. So let's say there is two. There are two questions. We get one wrong, one right, uh, and then we, the final score will be one out of two. Okay. So question now is: How many roads must a man walk down? And I guess the answers here are just going to be uh, three four, five, or six, 42, four, five, or six. Got to have a correct answer. Um, like so, and then it's going to ask us a little bit more. So this is going to, this has got to say something like, let's do a new line here. And it's got to say game over. Something just to make it a bit clearer. So, how many roads must a man walk down? Presumably people of other genders can walk down different numbers. Four, five, and six. Um, and then we're going to answer correctly this time. So, correct. just like that. So let's give an answer. So our next answer is going to be a new line. All right. So now we've written a very comprehensive test that checks the whole thing works. It's probably the last test we need. Maybe this is, maybe we will be done if this passes. We'll think about that in a second. Um, so what do we do? We first ask the question. So that means um, writing a standard output line, 
which is going to look something like oh, I forgot what, how we did it it's going to say question blah and then the question so question um, I guess let's call it num full stop and then the question um, which we're going to have to do here so it's going to be question dot question um, and I guess I, I find it a bit untidy to have different like some things getting substituted indirectly and some not um, now this is going to be we're going to enumerate this we're going to iterate through the questions and then enumerate them and that should return i comma val so yeah num comma question so if you haven't seen enumerate before it just transforms an iterator into an iterator of number and then question and of course it will start counting at zero so we actually want num plus one um, and let's just see whether we get any, we're anywhere near what we should be doing. So yeah, it's asked us what is six times nine. It's this looks pretty pretty good. Um, now it's going to offer us the answers. Oh, and I've indented them in my test, but this indentation gets swallowed by this backslash here. That's really annoying. Um, what should we do about that? Just say that it's there's a dot here probably fine isn't it in real life I'd probably have to do something cleverer than that because that dot would look a bit ugly but for this it's fine okay so where did we get to so we've got to go through all the answers um, and again we need, probably need to enumerate them uh, or no let's zip them let's zip them so let's first of all make an answers list so answers well we could make a vec or we could be clever and make some chained iterators here um, let's try that so it's going to be iter tools if we have that do we have the iter tools uh, no in that case it's going to be a little annoying so let's just make a vec so let's start off making a vec of just the, the correct answer um, which I think is correct answer I don't know why it wouldn't auto complete there um, uh, dot, I guess clone it and then we're going to push the other we're going to uh, extend answers with question dot incorrect answers um, which is gonna we need to like I guess if we just iter them that'll be good enough um, dot cloned maybe copy all the things in this vec and then add them onto the end of things so now we've got a thing called answers um, and it's also going to be um, letters, which is going to be an array of, uh, we'll do strings, or strs rather, A, B, C, and D. And then we're going to, the thing we're going to loop through is going to be a zip of those two things, letter, comma, answer in answers dot iter dot zip letters so that means pair them up oh hold on it should be it should be letters because I want the letter first letters dot iter dot zip answers now we are going to make an assumption here that there are four answers for every question which is how we expect it to be um, but really probably we should check for that assumes for answers for every question I mean maybe this program interoperates with some other adder 
which doesn't follow those rules. Um, okay, we can do that. Um, yeah, maybe there's some other adder that creates answers that questions that don't always have four answers, in which case this, this, the fact that this has got four things in and the fact that this zip works um, won't, won't be a correct assumption. Now, what is it complaining about? Oh, we have to say what, what its type is. It's a vec of Amsenstra, but it, but they're actually tick static Amsenstras, if that is a problem. No, it's not a vec, sorry. It's obviously an array. An array of Amsenstra. Um, of size four. Yeah, okay. This is how we, we define like a const array. Now we're going to loop through the letters and the answers, and for each one we're going to print something out. So write the standard outline, um, and it's going to be, I think it was dot space, then the letter, then a dot, and then the answer, I think. So we're going to take a break in a second, but let's see whether that gets a bit further in our test. What is six times nine? Ah, oh, we yeah, we forgot the brackets, but otherwise it's looking good. It's looking good so far. So more to do. We'll take a break there. And we're back on with more of the show. So we are at the point where we have a question being asked with the answers, but no round bracket next to the letter. So we can fix that for a start. So that's just because we should have it looking like this. And now the, the question looks about right, but then we don't ask we don't ask for the person's answer. So that, that actually need we actually need to implement that. We're expecting to ask for the answer. And so we should just do env dot stood out. Right. Right stood out line. Your answer. Actually, A, that's the wrong thing. It should be right stood out line. And B, if we're going to have a new line at the end of it, um, let's just say two owned here. If, we, uh, if we're not going to have a new line at the end of it, we need a new function instead of right stood out line. And I can't really be bothered with that. So I think I'll change my test to expect a new line. Um, which I guess, I guess just means, yeah, I was probably already expecting a new line. Let's see, let's see. So let's get rid of that extra space if we're going to have a new line instead. See how the test looks. So now we're saying your answer, blah, 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 or blah. And then we need to say whether you got it right or wrong. Could have sworn I got rid of that. Line. Oh no, yeah. There are two, that was the problem. All right, so now we have to say whether you got it right or wrong. So if, uh, let's first of all, let's just say the incorrect one so we can check the rest. The other bit of our test is actually testing. So we have to say incorrect, the correct answer was A. And remember, of course, um, We've hard coded that the correct answer is A, so we don't have quite so much work to do as we really would. But we're technically complying with the question, so you know. Now, oh, and look, my test is wrong because it says question two. Uh, it should say question two, so let's just make the test have the right number, otherwise things are really going to get bad. Okay, so. Right, now have we got to? The correct answer was uh, so incorrect, the correct answer was A, that all looks right. Then it asks the next question. Uh, except it says, oh, for our second question, it says incorrect, the correct answer was A, when it should say correct, 
and then say game over and stuff. So I guess we need to get the correct bit correct first. So we need to read. Uh, let's just say provided answer to make it clear. It provided answer equal env dot read stood in line. Um, and then we're just going to if it if provided answer. We better lowercase it. I don't feel the need to test this. I probably should, but. We've spent so long on this question, I think this is probably okay. And again, this is going to need, so we're, we're kind of hacking, kind of faking this a tiny bit. But we need really some kind of to do. So here it should be, I guess, to do shuffle, shuffle the answers. Shuffle the answers. And here it should be to do. Um, check for the real correct answer, not just hard code to A, not just, not net just. Um, oh, all right, so this should be, this is giving us back an option. So I guess. When do we get back none from this? I guess it's when either when the um, standard input is closed. So I guess if they they don't provide any answer, do we want to give up or do we want to ask them again? Um, I think. What I would really like to do is ask them again, but then I'd have to also provide a like Q to quit, or I guess that you could just say, or Control C to quit, or something like that. So I think what I want to do is just say, if you didn't provide any answer when I asked you to provide an answer, I, either because you closed standard in or closed the program or something like that, then I just want to, um, I guess I just want to stop. I feel a bit bad about it, but like I said, I've been doing this question for a long time. I think we've get, we've got quite a lot of good rusty knowledge out of it. So let's just stop here. So what we would do is um, uh, change read stood in line, maybe to return errors if it was going to fail, or um, none if you just if you'd closed the stream by pressing Control D or something like that. But instead, I just want to say uh, if. Well, let's just say let um, provided answer equal provided answer else. Um, and let's just print something to standard out, which again, we should test, but we're not going to test it. And it should write to standard error. Um, failed to read answer. And then return. So now we've got this let else structure means that provided answer is now a string. So we can to lowercase it. Uh, we need a semicolon. And then once we've to lowercase it and check whether it's A or not, we can say whether the answer is right or not. Correct. Now, what does it look like? We have to say correct, and then we will eventually say game over with another new line before it. So once we finish, once we come out of the loop, we're going to write a stood out line, which is empty. And then we're going to write a stood out line saying game over. And then we've got to give the score, I guess. Game over. Total score. To do. I don't feel the need, I think, to write multiple tests with different scores. I think I can trust that if I get one out of two in this test case, that we're probably covering things. So let's see how that goes. So it looks very close. We got the, these things still line up with each other. It'd be nice to get a better diff, but um, this looks like we've got the same string set we've got it to do here. So all we've got to do is count number of right and wrong answers. So 
we're already enumerating to get the question number, but it's a little bit hard to get the total out of that because this num won't be defined outside of this for. So I think I've probably got to make another variable. Total questions. Another variable, correct answers. Uh, correct provided answers, just to be absolutely sure. Now what we might decide is that we don't want this num anymore because total questions is actually going to be exactly the same number as num at all times. But it actually feels a bit neater to me to have them separate because they have different jobs. So I'm not, I don't mind wasting the extra um, eight bytes to have plus the extra CPU instructions to add one here. And then here we can just say total correct. Uh, no, is it num? What did I say? Num correct. Correct provided answers. Well, I spelt it wrong, but yeah. Plus equals one. Rename that to provided answers. And now we're nearly ready to have this test passing. And at that point, we might be done. We'll have to double check whether we've got. So that's correct provided answers and total questions. I mean, I guess we could just use, instead of counting, we could just use questions dot questions dot len. Is that better? That's probably better. There's no need to mutate this variable every time around the loop when we've actually got a length already. So instead of total questions here, we can just do questions dot questions dot len. The only thing is like, could we leave uh, could we um, break early out of this loop and then that wouldn't actually be the number of times we've gone around the loop, but we're, the only time we're, we're finishing early, we're actually returning, so. Yeah, I feel bad about my error handling because they told us to handle errors and here I am not really handling that error very well. I mean, I'm handling it, but not very well. Our tests passed, okay. So I think we might be done with this question. Let's reread the summary of the question and decide. So it does have two modes. It does run as a command line tool. Um, we are able to enter questions and save them into the JSON file. I guess we better check whether it works, hadn't we? So what have we got in our quiz.json? At the moment, we've got two answers in there. Fine, that's probably good enough. So let's run it in quiz mode. And let's answer B for this one. Incorrect, so the correct answer is A. And let's answer A for this one. Correct. And now let's just make sure if you answer them both correctly, do you get two out of two? Yes, you do. Okay, so it is working. I don't, as I say, I don't feel the need to write a unit test for that. So it feels like our quiz program is working. Presents the questions one by one, reads and verifies the player input, presents the score at the end. Um, errors are correctly handled. It doesn't panic. Well, that's it. So our, our application doesn't panic, and we did show off use of the question mark. So I guess we're okay. Um, and yeah, most of our logic's in the library part and is properly unit tested. Um, and then stuff like the real standard in, um, real command line arguments. Where are they? Are they in the application? Because they were very clear that they should be, weren't they? Um, well, yeah. So yeah, I mean, real environment, technically real environment could be inside the main.rs function, uh, a module, and then it would be, um, isolated to just the main method. But I feel like this follows the spirit of the instruction. The, the real um, CLI parsing, command line argument parsing, and the real environment get created here, and then they're passed into this uh, function, which is all like abstracted from all of that and testable. We've even got a test for it. And then inside there, all the other stuff is completely abstracted from it. So I think, I think we're following the spirit of that. Um, it is divided up into modules. Um, Okay, we didn't do this because that's not the way I roll. And I certainly didn't do this. I had no idea what the module structure of my application was before I started writing them. So I I don't see how you do that or what benefit it provides. Okay, we've done it. We've, we've finally done question B2P. Uh, 